We'll have a couple minutes before 6 30, so feel free to visit. <laughs> Make sure you all use your mics up there. Yes, oh, remember to use your mics. Okay. Okay. Okay.
are grateful for all of our many blessings in this city. Thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The audience is right? The flag is right? <laughs> <laughs> All of you in the Pledge of Allegiance. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we are going to turn this over to Wade Hyde, who is going to go through our recognitions for tonight. Thank you, President Taylor. Appreciate that. Uh, first of all, um, like President Taylor said at the, the first of uh, just a few minutes ago, we do have presentations every month, um, most every month. Uh, usually we have three principals coming from different schools, and they tell us how the school's going and all the positive, wonderful things they're doing. And, uh, academically and, and in every way, and, and we're just so proud of all of them. And they do such a wonderful job. And last month we had uh, three principals that we'd like to recognize at this time in their schools. Uh, Shayla Eakins uh, at North Park did a wonderful job um, last month. Uh, Melissa Morris, our principal at Far West Schools, uh, did a wonderful job as well, and so did uh, Randy Rasmussen, who was principal at uh, Adele C. Young in the Middle School in Curtis City. So we have a um, a letter we'd like to send to them that we'll all sign, and uh, we thank them for their for their doing such a wonderful job and helping us to see the wonderful things that they're doing at their different schools. And I need to know, I, I just read emails, and I don't know these individuals personally, so is Ben Kunstler here? Oh, Ben's in the back, okay, nice to meet you in person, Ben. And uh, is um, Oakley Whiting here? Oh, Oakley. Oh, uh, you want to come here? Look into the window. I like that commercial. <laughs> anyway, we um, would like to, um, we have a, a letter for both Ben and for Oakley. And uh, anyway, I'll read it and then you'll know what this is all about. <clears throat> Uh, congratulations to you, your fellow teachers and students, on your success at the TSA State Competition. It was awesome to see 22 students participating from the Box Elder Middle School. It was even more rewarding to see that 10 students took first place in events and qualified for the National TSA Competition. That's remarkable. That's great. There were an additional 8 students that took second place and 7 students taking third. It's also nice to know that these students can also be eligible for the national TSA competition if others choose not to attend. The Box Elder Board of Education is very proud of each and every one of you and wish you nothing but success at the national TSA competition. The Box Elder School District is so proud of students and teachers who are associated with the Technology Student Association, which is a national nonprofit career and technical student organization of middle school and high school students who are engaged in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. A wonderful organization that will benefit students throughout their educational career and beyond. So we would like to congratulate all of those students at this time. Uh, I am going to, and I have to tell you, I please forgive me right up front because I'm going to uh, read everyone's name and if I don't get your name quite right, I do apologize. I practice, but I, I know I'm far from perfect. So here we go. In uh, biotechnology, in first place is, oh, and if you're here, if you would stand, that would be great. Okay, if parents are here, they can stand as well. Biotechnology, first place, James Fairbanks, Tai Lun, Amy Swenson, and Isabel Wilson. Okay. Career prep, third place, Easton Seacrest. <laughs> Challenging the issue, second place, James Biskey and Easton Seacris. Okay. Community service video, second place, Madison Alvarez, Caleb Birch, James Biskey, Madeline Kunzler, and Easton Seacris. Computer Aided Design Foundations, uh, second place, Madeline Kunzler. Data Science and Analytics, first place, Kendallin Daly and Donna Neal. 
We have them come up from the front. Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so those have already called their names. Come up front so we can, so we can see you. That is wonderful. Come right up. Come up here. Absolutely. Thanks. That's great. And if I call your name, please just come right up front. Okay, Essays on Technology, first place, Jaden Reeder. Forensic Technology, first place, Katie Fonsbeck and Isabel Wilson. Foundations of Information Technology, first place, Kata Birch. Inventions and Innovations, third place, James Bisky, Katie Fonsbeck and Amy Swenson. Junior Solar Sprint, third place, Zachary Buell and Samuel Ferner. Mass Production, second place, Katarina Kunzler, Madeline Kunzler, and Alexander Latin. Mechanical Engineering, first place, Kata Birch, James Biskey, Gage, Gage Forsberg, and Easton Seacrest. Medical Technology, first place, Amy Swenson and Isabel Wilson. Off the Grid, second place, Baby Blakely, Katarina Kunzler, Madeline Kunzler, Alexander Latin, and Jalen Breeder. Prepared Speech, third place, Amy Swenson. Promotional Marketing, second place, Katarina Kunzler. Tech Bowl, first place, James Biskey, Caden Fonsbeck, and Ty Lund. Technical Design, third place, James Fairbanks and Tai Lun. Vex IQ, third place, Matt Seflo and Grayson Stevenson. Video Game Design, second place, Gata, Gata Birch, James Biskey, Caden Fonsbeck, and Gage Forsberg. And Website Design, second place, Bailey Blakely, Kendallin Daly, James Fairbanks, Tai Lun, and Domin Neal. Let's give them all a big Easton, if I could. Easton, Easton is a neighbor, and he lives in the same cul-de-sac. My wife and I moved in five years ago, and 2017, we'd been in one day, and there comes a boom, boom, boom. And I open the door, and there's Easton. You got any kids live here? And at the time, I, I didn't, but my grandsons lived uh, at my house on and off, and Easton is a big old kid, and, and Deegan, my grandson, is a little kid, and He's always been so kind and nice to him, so I just wanted to say thank you to Easton for that. But that's always been something I've thought a lot about every time I see Easton, but treats and treats and all these kids are such good kids. So so thank you for, for that. And thank you, teachers, for all the extra time. And I know this is extra duties and uh, it's a club. And so I, I probably I think the best we can do is say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Ben Kunstler and, uh, and Miss Oakley Whiting for the teachers for the middle school. Uh, <coughs> says, Congratulations to you and all students involved in the FBLA mid-level CPSO state competition. It was awesome to see that three students qualified for the FBLA national competition. It was also incredible to see the entire FBLA mid-level team placed first in the overall chapter competition. Due to their incredible efforts, they now own the traveling trophy for F FBLA Mid-Level Outstanding Chapter in the state of Utah for 2022. So I think okay. The Box Elder Board of Education would like to congratulate all students and teachers involved in these wonderful accomplishments. We recognize that these 
Competitions truly make unique experiences in the lives of all students involved. We wish all those involved in the FELA National Competition continued success as they go forward. Thanks again for sharing your success with the Box Elder Board of Education. We encourage you to keep working hard and accomplishing those things that will bring you joy, happiness, and success in the future. And I would like to read their names as well. So uh, students, if you're here, please come up front. I want to read your name. Uh, first place, outstanding FBLA, FBLA chapter of the year. Third place, Annual Chapter Activities Presentation, Madison Alvarez, Kata Birch, and Amara Young. Second place, Business, Eth Business Ethics, Grayson Bird, Shelby Heiner, and Amara Young. Third place, Business Ethics, Brooklyn Barlow, Jaron Miller, and Alexander Titus. Hey, great, all right. First place, Business Ethics. <laughs> First place, Business Etiquette, Morgan Williams. Fourth place, Career Exploration, Morgan Williams. Fifth place, Career Exploration, Brooklyn Barlow. Fourth place, Career Research, Laura Segura. Fourth place, Community Service Project, Madeline Kunzler, Riley Wilson Sega, and Amara Young. And fourth place, Exploring Computer Science, James Biskey. First place, Exploring Technology, James Biskey. Third place, exploring technology. Excuse me, exploring technology. Alexander Titus. Fifth place, exploring technology. Shelby Heiner. Fifth place, FBLA mission and pledge. James Biskey. First place, financial literacy. Alexander Titus. Second place, financial literacy. James Biskey. Third place, financial literacy. Easton Secrets. Fourth place, interpersonal communication. Shelby Heiner. Second place, learning strategies, Izzy Hutchins. Hey, let's give them a big hand. Parks of the Board of Education, I'd like to congratulate.
Foundation. She with us on her continued success this year. Anyway, uh, congratulations to you and to the students involved in the Utah High School Association Regional Competition and Theater and Drama. Kudos to you and your students for winning the medal, as well as taking first place in the regional competition for 16 years in a row. Those two things are the only Box Elder Board of Education would like to congratulate each and every one of you on your hard work and dedication. Uh, please pass along to your students our appreciation for their awesome success. We appreciate the love and care you showed to all students. Thank you for helping them to become successful on their educational journey at Box Elder High School. Wishing you continued success in the Utah High School Association State Competition in Theater and Drama, where your entire team qualified to compete. We know you'll do awesome in that competition as well. So congratulations, Melanie. And I do have a list of the students. A bunch of them in here. Oh, yep. No thrills. Read your name, please come up. That's <laughs> new. Yes, we are Come on in. Here we go. First place in our one in one act play, best actor was Aiden Andrews. Aiden, are you here, Richard? Nope, nope. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> best actress was Olivia Powell. Okay. If I read your name, raise your hands. So we know who you are. Okay. <laughs> and they also won best on song. First place he set the side was Reese Hancock. Dramatic monologue. First place, Olivia Powell. Who wrote her own? She was self-written model. Second place was our student board member Sean Robinson. Woo! Third place was Larissa Forsgren. Viewers <laughs> monologue. First place Lucy Matthews, and second place Maggie Fisher. Musical theater. Second place Davis Nelson, Isaac Sadler. <laughs> Isaac Sadler, Kyler Gunderson, and Camden McCarthy. Pantomime, second place tie, Lydia McCalmet, and I hope I say this right, Keisha Valencia, and then Jenna Larson. <laughs> Contemporary scene, third place, Emily Daughtry and Skyder Green. Congratulations, students, and, uh, and this day as well. And turn around and we'll give you a fist bump or a handshake, okay? Thank you so much.
certainly not least, uh, we have a recognition for Marcy Hatch, which is the superintendent's secretary. Uh, the Fox Hill Board of Education would like to thank you for your hard work and dedication on our behalf. These past three months, our board has attended the Utah School Board State Conference in Salt Lake City, as well as the National School Board Conference in San Diego, California. We appreciate your efforts in making sure we are registered, have housing and transportation to and from these events. This is not an easy task since we all have different schedules, agendas, and conflicts. Thank you for always helping each and every one of us. The best part is that you always do your duties with a smile. The Box of the Board of Education wants you to know how much we appreciate you, not only during conferences, but always. And that's sincerely the Box of the Board of Education. So we appreciate Marcy. teachers and coaches that have been helping them and doing all that extra work. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. We're going to turn on time over now for some more recognitions. These are employee recognitions. Um, our assistant superintendent, Keith Meekham, is going to go through those. I can't sit there. <laughs> you think I can put that here? Will that pick up my voice? I'll speak talking loud. to it. I won't. I can pull it towards you. So let me just tell you, this is one of the days I get a little bit choked up. Why? Because we have some awesome people that work for our district. We have almost 1,600, over 600 teachers and just shy of 1,000 ESPs. We call them ESPs. Most people don't know what that stands for, even some of our ESPs. Back in the day, it used to be called classified. How would you like to be called a classified employee? It's classified. <laughs> so we've now moved beyond the word classified, and they're called educational support professionals. We love them. We're grateful for them. They're the ones that do everything besides the teaching. They get the kids to school. They make sure they're fed. They get one-on-one -on -one help with certain needs. They make sure the building's clean. They make sure IT's running. And the list goes on and on. Secretaries that organize, and they don't really get to see a lot of credit. We had over, we tried a new uh, Google form this year. We had lots of people who were uh, nominated, which is awesome. It's kind of shocking that we're going to recognize 10 of the almost 1,000 that were here. Everybody could be recognized for so many good things that they probably do forever. We don't really, we just is kind of come commonplace. But tonight we do get a, a record, jeez. I was told once you should never yell on a microphone, and Melanie, you know that I uh, break that, so. But he needs to talk to you. I know. So, <laughs> you want me to talk? Look at Keith. I jump can't right there. I can't stand. <laughs> so anyway, tonight, tonight, uh, we've got some awesome things. A plaque and a nice little uh, certificate to go get some good food. Our first one uh, in the para category is Colleen Eid. Colleen is right here. Uh, Colleen uh, has worked for our district for 25 years. And uh, most recently, how many years at Three Mile Creek? Oh my gosh, I moved from the old Perry school to Oh, you were Perry original. Yes. Oh my heavens. Yeah. So she's been Perry <laughs> all the way. Um, there are so many comments here. I'm just going to read one. I've worked with Colleen for 17 years. Every year she has a theme to go with the library. The students love the theme. It's been anything from Olympics, <coughs> camping, Dr. Seuss, and many more. Her lessons relate back to her theme. She teaches the students the ins and outs of a library. She teaches the students the love for books and how they can help in our lives. She plays games, reads to them, and genuinely cares for each student in the school. She has so much fun. Students are often coming back from library a few minutes late as they will need to check out their books. The students love Mrs. Eve. We're all very sad to see her retire, but we wish her the very best luck. But we'll always remember the impact she's had on so many students here at Perry, Three Mile Creek Elementary. Thank you, Colin. Oh, thank you. Um, the next one, another para. 
worked for our district for 23 years. By the way, we try not, at least I, the committee never tries to give someone a, a second award. Not that they aren't deserving, but we just try to mix it around. Uh, our other para is uh, Rhonda Schaefer. Will you come stand right now? Rhonda has been with me since I started teaching at the LSD 16 years ago. She was patient and helpful as I learned what I was doing those few years. She is reliable, always here for the students. She rarely misses days, and when she does, she has everything planned out on how her responsibilities will be taken care of. She is always looking out for the students, noticing what they need for success and happiness. She works extra for our aides and support professionals, helping negotiate things that bring the other better job satisfaction. She has been by my side through years of really hard students, enjoying and building students, loving what we do and who we work with. I can't think of recommending a better person for the outstanding ESP employee. Congratulations. We have uh, someone who works in custodial and maintenance, and uh, she's not able to be here because of a death in her family, but it's Betty Davis from Willard. And I'm not going to read it to her, but I have a meeting with her and the faculty at Willard next week, and I'll be presenting that to her next week. So Betty Davis is one of our um, recipients. Next one in the maintenance category is Robert Westover. Come on up, Robert. Robert, there's a lot of good things that can be said, but can I, uh, I'm going to tell you a, a memory this morning. I said, honey, you know, tonight was one of my favorite nights of the year. We get to honor some awesome ESPs, educational support professionals. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, she joked that, she says, are you going to wear a, a tie tonight? I think Carson story was asking if you're going to wear a tie. Mm -hmm. But then my wife had this story that told me. So 29 years ago, uh, my wife uh, was the volleyball coach at um, for Fox Seller High School. And she was a freshman coach. And she walks in the gym the first time. And Robert is at Fox Seller Middle School. And he has the nets up. He has the volleyballs out. And my wife thought she'd died and gone to hell. <laughs> but what I wanted to read was another awesome thing. Robert has been an incredible part of BEMS for more than two decades. He has a heart of gold, goes out of his way to serve all around him. He is dependable and always there. <clears throat> Just allergies. Working hard and doing his best. He fills in for others, does job no one else will, does things without being asked, watches out for those who are often overlooked, comes whenever he is called, even nights and weekends. His wife died this school year, and he still came in to take care of his responsibilities. Every year, he purchases a pile of yearbooks so he gives students who can't afford to buy their own. I don't know if I can read the rest of this, but I'll just tell you this. I feel so blessed that he's been a part of our, our life for so many years, and I'm going to miss him terribly. When he retires in June, I know that BMS will miss him too. food service. Wonderful people that do so many good things and they're just behind the scenes. And uh, this one has been here for 13 years in our district. Lacey Smith. <laughs> Let me read. There's many to read. I'm just going to read one. Lacey is phenomenal at making everyone feel welcome, loved inside the kitchen and out. She goes up and beyond, above and beyond, to make sure the kitchen is ran smoothly. She's not afraid to teach or show how to do things and uplift you along the way. All the kids look up to Lacey and look around for her to be good, told good morning. She'll sing and dance with the kids, help them with food, and help them clean up the spills. With the crazy world we live in and all the shortages of food and supplies, she still makes, she makes do with what we have, is always positive about it. 
She is the perfect coworker that everyone deserves to have. We love Lacey. <laughs> Kim's been in our district for 16 years. Uh oh, this went to font eight. This is going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> this looks like a mix. No, I maybe. <laughs> I can squint. There's just a lot of comments from different colleagues. Kim is a detailed organized leader in our kitchen. Kim's a fire hour cook and comes in one hour before the other cooks. She gets the main entree started, mixes the breads, and preps everything that needs to be prepped before the other cooks come to work. Kim has trained the other cooks to write notes on the recipes and on the production records that will be helpful the next time we prepare a dish. The cooks write how much was prepared and how much, and that goes on. Another thing about Kim as a leader is she's always looking ahead to make sure certain items and ingredients are ready for the next day. No one really thinks about that. Like, it's got to be ready. Someone has to do it. I'm glad you do. Uh, she cares and wants to give all her students a lunch that looks and tastes great. That is one of our goals in our kitchen, and she helps us make that possible. Kim's a team player, gets along with all the ladies in our kitchen. She's willing to help out where needed. Her work schedule is always filled with things to do, and it makes her the happiest because of her amazing work ethic. Having Kim uh, work at Bucks Elementary Middle School has been a blessing to us and to our kitchen. On a personal note, um, I don't know if I'll read that, but through a, a terrible time, a tough time, through it all, Kim has been a leader and has helped bring us all together and as we cope through losses and challenges. The kitchen staff of BMS is the best all around and we strongly consider her for ESP. Congratulations, <laughs> Transportation. There you are, Scott. Thank you. I thought I saw you come in and then I didn't see you. So <laughs> come on up, Scott. Scott's been driving in our uh, district for five years. Talk about a job. Be supervising kids and don't look back. <laughs> I don't know how that exactly works, but uh, you can look in a mirror. <laughs> yeah, and they're all well behaved. <laughs> Never getting out. <laughs> They are well behaved. Yes, sir, they are. That's why he's the ESP today. Um, it just says, Scott and I attend the same religious congregation. However, I know about Scott because I've heard comments as I pass by. I love my job, which at first got me wondering what kind of job this man had. I have the best job in the world, was another, and one more recently. I love the kids on my bus. How many of us can often say these statements with a big grin on our faces as Scott shares with others? At first, I didn't know Scott was a bus driver for our district. Now, every time I hear, heard him express his love for his job and the kids, it makes my day, especially when I hear, I'm looking forward to going to work tomorrow and see my kids. When you think about it, we're lucky to have someone like Scott who is kind, greeting the students early in the morning as they get on the bus route to school, having positive experiences like this, one at the beginning of your day, it makes for a great day. The kids on a Scott's bus are lucky to have this daily positive experience. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you. Think about what a kid does first thing. They get out of their house, they leave their mom, dad, family, and the first thing they see is a bus driver's face. And what a powerful influence that is. Our next one in the transportation department um, is Nicole Hess. She's not here. She's not here. Can I get a time when we can come out and make a big deal out of it? Yep. You let me know. So Nicole just recently became our route coordinator. If you want to talk about a stressful job, <laughs> everybody that drives has got to be on a bus. Everybody that's in our school that wants to ride a bus has to be on a route. That route can't mess up. Pretty amazing what she does, and no one really thinks about it because it just happens every day. But we'll talk more about Nicole, so thank you, Jason. Nicole Hess. Let's see, did I see Terry? I was uh, so excited to see you. Come on up, Terry Basinger. Terry has been with our district for 25 years. She's been at Box Other High School for 20, 
five years. <laughs> uh, I was at Box Elder High School. I was just this, uh, you know, young buck with hair, kid maybe. I don't know. It's hard to say. But I remember when she got hired. And I remember she kind of took over a legend. At least that there was this expectation. Someone's going to run this school. And Terry just jumped right in. And we have just kept going. And uh, so proud of uh, Terry. But I uh, just want to say something. Terry's awesome in all that she does. She's very helpful to all who comes into the office. It could be parents, teachers, or other staff members. Terry's very good at helping Miss Kent. She makes sure she is where she needs to be. And more importantly, she helps her with her health needs, making sure her sugar is in check. Not many staff members would go above and beyond the regular work duties to make sure people are okay in their life. She helps others with this as well. Terry's a very compassionate and hardworking secretary. She has been here for 20 plus years and knows the ins and outs of everything. And by the way, when you're a teacher, you don't go talk to the principal, you go talk to the head secretary. <laughs> if a teacher has a question, you can always go to Terry to find out the answer. Terry also helps them with things that need to get done in the summer. Always willing to give a hand and do what is needed. So Terry, congratulations, long overdue. Last one um, is Betty Dallin. Betty Dallin has worked a century. I don't know if she's worked there the whole time. Are the Dallin, is the Dallin family here? Yeah. Has she been there the whole time? Yeah. 40 years. She was well into her 70s and was working up until just Christmas. And she got sick and just recently passed away. I wish she was here. After 40 years... But uh, just Betty Down was the epitome of hard work with a smile. She was not only our telephone gal, our copy guru, our nurse, and so much more, but she was a good friend to all. She always has the time to fix any need for a little person or a big person. Betty has been our longtime standing figure in this district, but more importantly to our little school community. Betty has always showed up to work smiling and enjoys her work. She's greeted every student and employee with a help and a smile. She always tried to do whatever she could do to help anyone out when they would step into an office. It didn't matter what it was. She always would do her job with a smile. She made Century Elementary a very important place and a happy place to be every day. So congratulations to Betty. I know she can hear that. Thank you, family.
soccer team is, is very poor. Uh, we got the both fans are on the same side of the field. I, I've attended very many sports events. Of all the sports, soccer is probably the one you don't want the fans on the same side. I love track. I go to track. I can sit there with the other fans and we're all just cheering for our kids and it's great. Soccer is just not. <laughs> so, um, is We're, this at Box Elder? Or Box Elder. Box Elder. Okay. Uh, if you go to any other sports in all the rest of the region, they've got separate fans. They mostly do it on the football field. I re I've been told that there's some concrete that needs to be removed to be able to do it on our football field. If, if that's what we wanted to do, I can arrange to make that happen. Uh, but somehow we need to improve the side field, in my opinion. Talk a lot to parents. Obviously, we all agree, but uh, if it's a funding issue, you know, just give me approval, I'll, I'll make something happen. So, thank you for being here. Then we have David Parker and Alicia Parker. Let's see that right. That's a little more intimidating than I expected. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, we live by Bear River High, we live by corner of the parking lot. Um, we've lived there for about eight years. Since we've lived there, great community, we love it. Um, we've had consistent problems with, um, I would like to say students, but I'm not sure they're students, but on the weekends we have problems with youth racing in the parking lots, vandalism, they broke my neighbor's fence. Um, we've spent the last weekend, we spent our um, spring break weekend cleaning up the sidewalk because of all the broken glass. Um, we petitioned to the police department to do something about it and they tell us that it is a school problem. As we petition to the school, they tell us it's a police problem. Um, I've offered my crew of guys to, if the school would provide some funding for materials, um, that my crew would go out there and we could help put up fencing, 
gates. Um, I guess our solution is if the, the parking lot was secured in the evening, the vandalism kids couldn't be in there. Um, it's been a constant draw on the police department. We call them every weekend, and it's it's gotten bad enough that this last weekend uh, they had the kids were parking in the parking lot, um, doing their thing, partying, and um, they jumped my fence. They're getting into our yards, and um, it's it's very frustrating. And I, we feel as uh, active participants of the, of the community that we should do our part. Um, and that's why we've we've thrown out ideas that we could help provide funding or the service to put up gating so that the, the parking lot could just be closed on the weekends or evenings and that way the problem could be alleviated. Um, I understand the police's uh, position that they don't want to create a bad um, rapport with the kids and constantly be citing them tickets or, you know, they, they would like to keep a good relationship with that and for us, the solution is just lock the gate. We lock up the rest of our property to keep it safe. And for me, I'm just a little confused why we don't lock up our parking lots and keep the neighborhood a safe, clean place as well. So that's uh, our concern that we've had. So I guess we're here to plead with or plead with you guys. So you know, generally uh, we don't always respond, mm -hmm. but uh, Connie made us aware. I think you talked to Connie, mm -hmm. and we appreciate that. So I've talked with. Corey Thompson in the back, he's our facilities director. And we've already started the ball rolling on some things, at least lighting. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've, we've talked about having uh, really low lighting, but we'll maybe kick on with motion mm -hmm. and cameras, you know, to begin with. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, with what you're just offering right now, I think we'll go further and, and, and you know, see the, it, it becomes problematic, you know, lock, locking mm -hmm. it up, but, but we'll, we'll look into all that. Okay. We, we really want to be good neighbors. Right and, I will lock him up if you want me to. That's fine. I'm already a crossing guard. Do it. And, and so, like, if, with all those things, um, we've talked to a lot of neighbors as well, and they've said if there's anything we can volunteer, if, like, if, if gating or something like that were to go forth, um, we have people that would donate um, their time, labor. Um, as far as my company goes, we would donate um, any services possible that we can in fabrication or construction or any of that um, to help alleviate the problem. So. This is going on in that far east corner of the driver's head, is that? Yes. The whole parking lot. The whole, the whole parking yeah. lot. The whole they do donuts, lot. they race down that side, they chuck their beer bottles across the fence because they it's funny. I don't know. <laughs> so. There is underage drinking. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> They've almost gone through my fence with their cars doing donuts. Well, yeah. we're, we're taking your... your Okay. And not only that, the school has actually had to pay to fix fences that they yeah. have broken too. So it's it's a money suck. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to take it very seriously and see what we can do. Like how it's going to take some time, but maybe sure. through the summer, you know, spring, uh, we can maybe make something happen. I'm not going to make any promises, but we're going to we're going to do something. Just don't working. placate us. That's all. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming. So thank you. Uh, I work for Whitaker Construction. We have concrete barrier that we don't need. We can oh. take it up, drop it off, and Thank seal you. it up pretty quick. So. Corey, you got that down? <laughs> I know Corey. So okay, good. Any barriers you got? <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good timing. Yeah. People yeah. that are willing to participate and volunteer. Thank you. Um, if I could backtrack. Go ahead, Sorry, Jamie. going back to the boys' soccer, um, I can talk to, I'll talk to the rest of the government and we'll put up posters and we'll, we do a lot with school spirit, so I'll get that running and then hopefully it'll pick up, but that's something I can do right now. But. Thanks, Sean. Okay, and that's all we have for public comments, so we are moving on to our action items. <clears throat> our first item of business is approval of a new business administrator. And... As most of you are aware, Rod is retiring in, I don't know how many days, but he probably knows he, he exactly. Let me tell you down to Let me look at my phone. <laughs> Two months, 17 days, and 16 hours. Okay. Well, <laughs> oh. So we've had to, 
We've got some big shoes to fill, but we have interviewed and we had some great candidates for our business administrator position. And we have, as a board, um, selected David Roberts, who is here. His, is this your wife as well? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I don't know Susan. if she claimed that. <laughs> See? Well, thank you for being here. So, we have to officially make it official. <laughs> I'll make that motion. I would make a motion this evening that we um, appoint Mr. David Roberts to the position of business administrator for the Box Elder School District. I'll second. And I, have, and I would like to make one a correction in this, in the background. It talks with the resignation of Rockford. That needs to be retirement. So we change that so in the minutes and notes. Okay. So we have a motion by Connie Archibald and a second by Karen Cronin to appoint David Roberts to be our business administrator and then change by Nancy that it's because of Rod's re retirement. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So, welcome. We're really excited to have you, and Rod is going to... He spent, he spent the day with Rod today, and uh, talked to a lot of directors, and he's already started working on the, on the budget, so he's going to trade with, with us and Murray yeah. a few days now while he's still with Murray, and then when he's officially with us, he'll trade with them, and we'll, we'll get even. And we found out that we need his attention. It's David A. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, Susie. Do you know that? You, can you get his attention that way? Yeah, but I say his full name. Oh, oh. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't share that with us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, very good. We're happy to have you. We're excited, and it's going to be great. Okay, we have. Is Allison Williams here? Oh. Yeah, she uh, came down really sick. Oh, okay. She's just gone through her father in law passed away. I think she pushed pretty hard with funeral and everything. So she asked if I would take care okay. of Okay, so the college and career wedding us. So, just a little background uh, the state requires uh, they have, they'll have an annual review every three to six years and then they go through a self evaluation. So, uh, Allison just shares that the school has completed their self evaluation. Um, they have consistently received exemplary evaluations. I would just echo that as I've been on several committees, as I've <coughs> been high schools at the different levels. Uh, they've, they've done very well. Uh, we visited today as Alice and I have worked on some things with the council, but the things I would like to congratulate them on is with COVID and some of the challenges we've seen, the increase in graduation rates for the last couple of years, and I'd maybe reflect on some of the uh, conversations we've had, especially with Brian, when he's asked us to think outside the box. We know the traditional program is is limiting some of those in our graduation rates, and they've looked at many options uh, to, uh, and we've seen an increase in graduation rates. So, just a shout out to the, the counselors um, in that regard. But I would like to recommend that uh, the College and Career Readiness Counseling Program be authorized for the 22-23 school year. I'll move that the College and Career Readiness Counseling Program in the School District be authorized for the 2022-23 school year. So I have a motion by Brian Smith and a second by Karen Cronin to approve uh, the box or be authorized, the College and Career Readiness Counseling Program in Box Hill School District be authorized for the 2022-23 school year. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, approval of independent auditor, Rod. Every year at this time, we need an authorization from the board for <coughs> our independent audit. We'll audit this current year, the 21-22 fiscal year. <coughs> Typically, we recommend an independent, uh, did I say in so I meant independent auditor, and then typically we re recommend an internal auditor as well, but we've had the resignation of our internal auditor, Tom Potter, and so we are putting out an RFP for an internal auditor, and we'll have to do that at a later time. So tonight, it's just for Squire and Company to audit us for this current fiscal year. They'll start by with student counts in May and 
go through the first of October sometime working with us. Any questions? Make a motion we accept the recommendation of Rod for the ind independent auditor? Yes. Squire. I'll second that motion. Okay, so we have a motion by Karen Cronin and a second by Connie Archibald to approve uh, Squire and Company as the independent auditor for the 21-22 audit school year, fiscal year audit. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes. Um, approval of amendment from Lakeview. So we've got a couple, <laughs> Lakeview and Willard. We'll do them separately as to vote on them separately, but there's uh, trust land amendments. Carrie, do you want to? I think you write in there as to why when you're in their letter it was just they're reallocating their funding because they were not able to hire the service support that they were hoping to get. <coughs> and so they just reallocated that funding so that they wouldn't end up with a carryover. So. Okay. Is there any questions on that? Questions about that? Yeah, I'll make a motion. At the Mark Summers School District Board of Education approve the amendment for Lakeview's elementary schools land trust plan. I'll second. So a motion by Wade Hyde and a second by Brian Smith to approve Lakeview School Land Trust Plan Amendment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and I will make one for Willard Elementary at the school to approve the amendments to the Willard School Land Trust Plan. I'll second. You said thanks, Clyde. <laughs> so we have an amendment. <laughs> we have a, or not an amendment, a uh, motion by Karen Cronin and a second by Clyde Wildenmuth to accept the Willard Trust Land Amendment as presented. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Can you post? Okay, those pass. So well, I have a new question. Okay. I'm, I'm used to calling them trust land. When did they start being the land trust? Um, that was a change that the state board put together in order to make it more definitive to what it is. Um, it's, so when they when they was that just the, recently? It's been no. a while. Five years. Oh wow! We still call. We mostly call it. Why are they back? We wouldn't know that because we still hear people say school. Now I'm used to school and trust, but I know why that's the phrase you. The, the decision has been from the state and down to make more emphasis in what these really are. And so instead of just saying trust lands, by saying trust or school trust, it puts the emphasis on what it is going to be. Yeah, school lands trust. So yeah, it's just a de it's just a definition to help keep them protected and guarded and understand that this is not this is not public land that anybody can roam over and use at will. That these are public, that they are they are private property used for the benefit of the still children of the state of Utah. So, thank you for clarification. All right, let's move on to approval of school lunch prices. I saw Candace here. Candace? <coughs> yeah, why don't you know if so we can hear you, or the camera can hear you. Okay, I've never done this before, so correct me if I'm doing it wrong, okay? So, um, just kind of background on this, because of inflation and um, supply chain issues, our prices in the past few years, or our food costs in the past few years, have increased by 10%. Um, this is something that is not unique to our district, this is not unique to our state. Um, it's all around, and so um, we've been fortunate enough to the past two years to be able to offer free meals to all the students within the district and during the summer to the student, to all the children within the, within the county. Um, and the federal and state reimbursement have been able to cover those costs. However, as I'll talk about a little bit later, everything's kind of going back to normal and so we need to be able to um, still sustain our program. We are, I think, one of the few programs in our district that is self-sustaining. And so in order to continue to sustain our program, we need to be able to increase our prices a little bit. So. Um, so what I propose is that elementary and intermediate lunches um, increase from $1.90 to $1.95 and for middle school lunches to increase from $2.10 to $2.20. Any questions? Yeah. 
Okay. Who did you say was two, who did you say elementary was one ninety five? One ninety five, and then the middle school went to two or twenty. The high school What's just the high school staying the same? But staying the same at two fifty. Yeah. So does that mean the intermediate school? The intermediate school is also going up to with the middle with the, with the, with the, the elementary. elementary. Okay. And that's because their menu is similar to the elementary, and we don't feel to increase that would be fair to that at most schools. Candace, I just wanted to say I really appreciated where you put in fiscal implications, what it would cost a family, because I think that that's good information and yeah. things that we need to get out. Yeah, it, it will not, that, I mean, yeah. for a family of three, if they have three kids in the elementary, it would be $53 for the whole year, <coughs> an increase of $53 for the whole year. Um, I realized I calculated the middle school one incorrectly, but it really isn't that much different anyway. It, it's actually less than $26 that I originally indicated, so. That's good information. That's good information. Thank you for providing that. Okay. I'll move that the uh, price increase is expected for 2022-23 uh, uh, be approved. I'll do, I need that. To, do I need to yeah. state that she's already stated that now? I will second that. Okay, so we have a motion by Brian Smith and a second by Nancy Kennedy to approve the price increases for the school lunches this coming year. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes. Thank you. I've got half my kids to eat it every day, half take lunch every day. So <laughs> we're just splitting the difference there. That works. That works. I was just going to say until you say the next thing you do. So. Your, our child nutrition report, so okay. why don't you just go ahead. Awesome. All right, so it's been, as everyone knows, crazy for a couple of years. Our department has worked straight for the past since March 2022, or sorry, 2020. That's how long it's been. It feels like one continuous year. Um, <laughs> even during the summer, a lot of our cooks and a lot of our managers have not had a break. Um, so I just wanted to go over kind of the positives that have happened and some of the challenges that we're facing and continue to face um, and some of the um, upcoming things that are happening within our department as far as child nutrition. So, um, so some of the positives. Oh, thanks. That was really nice. Sorry. That's okay. Going well. I can just keep talking if you want. There you go. Okay. Um, so just more for your information, during Mar and from March 2020 to March 2022, we served over 3.4 million meals to students and children within our Box Elder County. Um, a lot of those are students that would not have normally qualified for free reduced price meals. However, data says that 69% of those children in our county would qualify, but for whatever reason don't apply for free or reduced price meals. Um, so that is something this coming year, because everything is going back to how it was before, where we they will pay for meals um, unless they qualify for free or reduced price um, benefits. That is something that we are trying to push very hard. Um, so in 2020, our free or reduced price percentage as a district was 33%, and it has dropped to about 26% because there has not been a need in parents' views to fill out the application. Now, we know that it's needed because of grants for Title I, all these different things that we need that data. We need those um, parents to fill out applications. However, um, they didn't feel a need to do so. So that is something that we are going to push to fill out that application, especially with the mill price increases. Um, they're going to have to budget for those mills, and if they qualify, they don't have to budget as much for anything at all. Um, but that is some of the, I guess, the positives of how many meals we've been able to serve with this um, waiver that the federal government has given us. Um, another thing that I've implemented, um, that our, my department has implemented, is to, we have managers meetings every month, and we've put them in work groups, um, three different work groups, modeled after PLCs um, to improve our processes, to um, Standardize, standardize our employee training and to improve our menus. Um, this is something we just implemented this year, and so it's kind of slow going getting that going, but we're hoping in the next year or two we be, we'll be able to see the results of those work groups to be able to improve our program. Some of the challenges that we're facing, um, first of all, are 
labor shortages. Again, this is not unique to our department. It's not unique to our district, um, not even unique to our state. It's just all around sh labor shortages. Um, like I said before, our cooks have worked continuously since March 2020, and they're tired. A lot of them are just burnt out, and that's, that's one of the reasons um, they're leaving, or, along with other reasons. But we're working to find ways to see what we can do to retain those employees. Um, because sometimes it's not a matter of just hiring them. If they don't stick around, it's, it makes it harder. So we're looking at ways to retain those. Um, another challenge that we're facing is supply chain issues. Again, not unique to our district, not unique to our department. Um, our vendors are saying that it could be 18 to 24 months before we even see any relief from that. Um, we are planning on having our menus back to normal, but we are continually doing menu changes. Um, as some of you are well aware, that our menus have gone down significantly as far as choices, um, as far as how many choices are available in even one day. Um, so, but we're, we're trying to accommodate those and we're trying to stock up when we can to make sure we have food available. Um, no kid will go hungry because we have the food available for them, um, but we are doing our best to be able to help that. We're also utilizing emergency procurement procedures so that we can um, go to different vendors without going through the normal procurement um, avenues that we would normally take. So. Some of the upcoming items, um, most if not all the waivers that we've been granted are, are discontinuing as of the end of this school year or June 30th, depending on which waiver it is. Um, so that means, like I said before, we are returning to paid meals where um, parents need to pay for their meals or pay the reduced price or see if they qualify for free. Um, another thing that mostly affects summer lunch is that we are not able to do non-congregate meals anymore. That means no more drive through meals um, that the parents can come pick up and just grab their food for their kids and go. Um, we will have two summer sites, both at the intermediate schools, um, or at both intermediate schools, I'm sorry, and those will be sit down meals that the kids can bring their, or that the parents can bring their kids to. Um, parents will not be able, unfortunately, to get the meal for their kids either. Um, so those are those are the two major ones that will affect the summer meal. Um, it doesn't really necessarily affect the normal school meal because we have not been doing that. Um, we haven't had any school shutdowns, fortunately, or we haven't had to utilize those meters during the school year. But it will affect. Um, the other item, another item coming up is nutrition standards are changing again. Um, previously, we were able to allow up to 50% um, white flour instead of whole grain rich. That's changed where we can only allow up to 20% on each line. And so that means we have to make changes to our menu um, to see what is basically more important. Do we have the white wheat or the white roll, or do we have a white flour cookie? Those are the decisions. They're not significant, but they do affect um, what the kids will take because sometimes they just. Well, I know yeah. this is always a problem because the kids don't eat the browns. Um, is there a way that we can? I don't know if it's just training. Is it? I mean, I just I'm concerned about the weight. I yeah. Watch kids go through and just dump. Mm -hmm. have their, their meal. Most of them want to go out and play, so they are you chuck it. Yeah, are you talking about training of employees or training of kids? Well, training, <laughs> yeah, training of kids. I mean, is how do we get them? Because families are eating eighty percent of their no their food at home, and I just, mm -hmm. I just, I just, I just, it just hurts me to see that much weight. Right, and that's where we're having the conversations with our managers in those work groups that I talked about of what would be a good way to introduce this? How can we present this so that the kids will eat it? A lot of times it's, I, oh, I'm gonna say this wrong, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, I think it's like 10 or 11 times to be exposed to something that kids will finally accept it. Um, and if it's on the menu once a month, that's what, nine times that they're, and then they have to, um, then it's another school year. It is not something I agree, it's not something that's in the, in the homes. Um, but research has shown that it is a healthier option. Um, 
but we are going back to 80% whole grain rich. And whole grain rich, for those that don't know, that doesn't mean the whole thing's whole grain. It means that at least 50% of that item, has, of the flour in that item has whole grains in it. So the rest can be white, so it's kind of a mix. So we have to have 80% or 50% of 80% of the items. Is that right? <laughs> that was a math piece. Sorry. <laughs> 80% of the items have to have 50% right. whole grain, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yes, um, the other nutrition standard is that we must meet sodium limits um, before that was put on hold, um, but that is now being implemented. And the next two slides, I don't. if you want to just show it real quick, those are just what the standards are. This is for breakfast, um, and then the next slide is the sodium standards for lunch, depending on the grade. Um, we are meeting the sodium standards for kindergarten through fifth and sixth through eighth, as far as actually um, both targets date, July 1st of this year and July 1st of next year, we're meeting those targets. Um, the ninth through 12th, we are just a little off, but that's something we're working on to make sure that we're within those targets by July 1st, and then also we'll work to meet those targets by July 1st of 2020. So, um, and then the last two things, um, and I'll just talk about price increases. This is what you just approved. Food costs are rising. Um, it was in the data that I've seen in 2019, that's the most recent data I had. The average meal cost, not for, not for our district, but for everywhere within the, within the county, the average meal cost was $3.11 in 2019. Assume that that's increased. Um, so we are still lower than what the average cost was in 2019. Um, and then the last thing is, not, not yet, I, I went one hit ahead, so go back real quick, oh, sorry, oh, oh. <laughs> is Smart Start. Um, so that is a house bill that was passed a couple years ago, actually, but it's kept being postponed because of the pandemic, House Bill 222. Um, and that requires, um, first of all, requires breakfast being offered in every school, which it is in our schools. Breakfast is being offered in every school. Um, and then based on the free and reduced price percentages, an alternative breakfast model needs to be offered in the schools that meet the free and reduced price or more of that um, free and reduced price percentages. The first one is 70%. The only one we have that meets that is Drow's Creek, and they're already offering an alternative breakfast model, so we're not worried about that one. Um, the next one, by May of 2023, um, 50 of those schools with 50% or higher free or reduced price numbers need to offer an alternative breakfast model, and then any school with 30% or higher free or reduced price numbers need to offer a breakfast model as of May 20. Um, so, can disguise, what is an alternative breakfast? So, that would be breakfast in the classroom, second chance breakfast. We do have schools that do offer those, um, out, I mean, outside of this bill, they were already offering. For example, Bay River High and Box Elder High both offer second chance. So, between first and second period, they offer a breakfast to students. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, especially since it's been free, those numbers have increased. A lot. So before it was free, it was about, I want to say 100 mils. Now it's gone up to about 300 mils, 300 breakfasts a day that they're offering to those students. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, so that's what's coming up. Any questions? All right. You did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts in this, especially with all the. <laughs> When you start thinking, like, you have to figure out how much sodium things have and all the bills and the wheat and the <laughs> supply chain and the middle. So you're doing a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate but it. I like the, works really hard, so. I like your PLC model, too, for your work groups. I hope that I hope that works We'll see how it goes. I think yeah. it'll be good. So. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Nutrition for the seven or eight times I presented. <laughs> One time they, they come in here and they had samples to get to eat. So this year I thought I'm going to do something a little more subliminal. So I'll, the lights were dim several times. At the first <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Next, it's going to shut right. <laughs> 
Okay, um, you can go to like the third slide probably where the good stuff is. One more. Well, yeah, one more. Okay, this, this slide shows the key accomplishments that we've done, we being uh, the energy program. Um, we have continued to, we do a, a uh, for all our long breaks, spring, fall, Christmas, and Thanksgiving, we do a, a shutdown checklist that I send out to all the schools and the teachers before they leave, go through this checklist and make sure that, that all the lights are off, the smart boards are off, blinds if they have them shut, just ways of, of saving, conserving energy. Um, we, uh, we, we run about 70% participation with all of the schools. I uh, just counted them up from our, our last spring break and we were at 78% participation for this, this spring break, uh, which is excellent in my, in my mind. So, uh, some of the numbers that go down there, cost avoidance slash energy savings program to date. We have saved over $1.9 million as of the end of February. These, these numbers are all through February. It takes about a month for the, for the, the, the data to come in. And that's so about the middle of the month, I start uh, gathering those up and input. So, so this is as of February. So what's the cumulative on that starting month? Uh, this is, the, you mean the program date? Yeah. It, uh, we started the program March of 2015, so, um, which we've reduced the usage in KBTUs 11.6 percent during that that same time period. Um, one of the other things that I do is I review the the utility bills. Uh, there's over well. 10,735 utility bills have been input uh, with a total value of 14 plus million dollars. Um, in reviewing those, we've been able to find $61,700 of uh, other savings, either erroneous utility billings or rebates, those kind of things. So overall, the program savings is, is over $2 million to date. Um, I believe the, uh, the plan was that I would get 10% of that. <laughs> I can't remember if I was in writing or not. So it may not be. Um, so this chart here, uh, that just kind of shows the trend. This chart, as I was putting it together, reminded me of when I was going through the schools one of the schools that I that I wandered in on, uh, it's very entertaining to walk through schools because there's little signs and posters, whoops, and all kinds of stuff as you as you walk through the schools. There's one on uh, there's a note on the board. Um, it said a farmer had 97 cows in the field, but when he rounded them up, he had 100. <laughs> so, as I, as I looked at this chart, I said 1.9 million. I'm going to round that up to 2 million. <laughs> it, took me, it took me a minute. It took me a minute to read that. Okay. I had to go back to my former days. Okay, uh, next chart. This is the cost avoidance trend for three years. Um, the, the big purple line, I got to make sure I'm on the right, right year here. The, the big purple line um, was water savings. No, the big purple line was uh, COVID shutdown. We were able to save quite a bit of money by not going to school. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite figured out how to do that while we're in school. Um, then the next one is, is water savings, the one through August, September, October. So um, last year with the drought, we, we really 
we really bumped up our, our water conservation. So that was that was that short. Uh, next, next we have the cost avoidance by utilities. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the biggest cost avoidance is in electricity, but that's also our biggest user. We use about 60% of our utility bills is, is electricity. Uh, natural gas is uh, 30%, and then the water and uh, 9%, and propane is about 2%. So that's why the, the numbers for those other utilities aren't as big as the electricity. Um, when you break it down, as far as usage reduced, um, electric usage has been reduced by 15.7%, natural gas 9.6%, uh, propane has been reduced by 15.8%, and water has been reduced by 19.3%. So those are, that's, that's usage. Um, the, the dollar figures you kind of have to look at and say, okay, is this, is this really savings or is this just uh, cost of energy going up? But the usage tells us that we are, we are saving and we are reducing. Um, as far as the environmental impact, not only do we save energy, but uh, energy slash money, we also have an impact on the environment as well as we save. And this is just kind of a fun chart, the, the feel good, warm and fuzzy chart. Um, we've reduced emissions by 12,398 12, metric tons, which is the greenhouse gas emissions from um, miles driven by an average vehicle, 30,774,285 miles. Um, the amount of Carbon sequestered by 14,672 acres of U.S. forest in one year. That's the equivalent of CO2 emissions from 1,500 homes for one year. Or this is one I really like, the CO2 emissions from 506,663 propane cylinders used for home barbecues. So, um, <laughs> well, when I have my, my team meetings, which is just me, um, <laughs> I have to find something to do with so. <laughs> well, I'll probably just fight with the other people. <laughs> um, okay, so going forward, we're looking at uh, spark, smart timers for our irrigation systems. Um, we're thinking that's one way we can we can uh, help save save water, save money. Um, as a district, we're continuing to uh, look for well, not look for, but replacing uh, the fluorescent lights, incandescent lights with LEDs where we can. Um, or he's been really good about providing uh, monies for that and resources. Um, and then we're going to continue to track and monitor utility usage and, and look for other opportunities to save. So, any questions? Okay, I'm just going to uh, wait until we got to our conference. But, um, Mike's here tonight. Sure. Share some information. Um, I, at our conference, I um, stopped by a couple of companies that work with people like yourself. I'll just give this information to you. And, want to use it. One of the things that I thought was really interesting as I spoke with one of the representatives is um, they have a curriculum that they use to engage students in a lot of the stuff that you do. So the, the data gathering and, and calculating maybe math students or if there's specific classes at the high schools and, and they have curriculum that they could use students to help you in what you do. I thought that was kind of interesting. So, we are getting to a PLC group. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, take a look at that, and if there's any information there, um, it would be helpful to you. Okay. Very good. Thank you.
But I did want to compliment Candace. She came in here brand new, got hit by COVID, and has done a fantastic job in organizing, keeping lunches going, uh, using bus drivers to help serve lunches when they couldn't drive during 2020. Uh, she's just done a fantastic job. So I wanted to thank her. And then Mike, uh, we started out contracting with Synergistics. And we've actually hired Mike as our energy specialist now. And the same thing, you can see the savings when you come through okay. there. So I just want to compliment them. Awesome. Very good. Thank you. Plus, in the middle of all that, Candace had a baby. <laughs> and I was just thinking, is, is your husband home tonight, the baby? And yes, he texts me every 10 minutes. The baby won't sleep. The baby won't eat. <laughs> <laughs> how, old, how old is he now? Four months. Four months. Oh, I should have accidentally put in a picture of him on the side. But... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for your work. Now we get to the transportation report with our new transportation director, Jason Sparks. Well, thank you. I've uh, had a huge learning curve this year, transitioning from being involved in, in, in a school setting to uh, buses and bus drivers and bus pairs, and it's been a huge learning curve for me, but I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, I will tell you, I didn't realize as a principal the amount of work that goes in to move kids to school and back. And every day, as, as we're doing that, the sheer volume of, of work and and how um, transportation personnel just jump forward and are always there and are caring and, and definitely they love their job, which I'm glad they do. Um, just a few things I wanted to share and, and um, hold off on the video just for a second. I shared, I shared a document, but I don't know if it got in, but I shared it to you again, Keith. You, you got it. That's it. Yep. Thank you. So I just wanted to highlight... Um, before I jump into this, I just um, went to a conference two weeks ago in St. George for uh, transportation. And I came back feeling very good about being from Box Elder and having the people I have. Because as I talked with other directors, I got the feeling of, wow, I, I've got the best place <laughs> from what I'm seeing and, and, and the best people. And truly, um, they are doing amazing things. Um, part of our emphasis this year has been training. And, and part of that is because the federal government is changing some guidelines and how training has to take place. In part, um, one of our districts south of us lost a, a lawsuit and it created an issue where um, it was demonstrated they were negligent and not making sure drivers are trained. So that's what I'm trying to avoid and that's why we're doing a lot of training. Hey Jason, just, yeah. just a point of reference, everybody south of us. I know. I didn't want to point a finger at one of my friends, but um, so, <laughs> so he's a proud graduate of Bear Lake High School. Yes, I am. And, and my grandpa was his principal. So a lot of dirt on each other. Yeah. So some of the training we've done this year is the happiness advantage, uh, love and logic, uh, reporting to DCFS, which. Um, as I know, kids will come talk to drivers and parents before they'll talk to teachers. And so we spend some time talking about the procedures and why they need to report and how we will support them with that. Uh, behavior management, because honestly on a bus, you turn your back and you're driving a bus with 85 kids behind you. And, and you've got to get that bus down, this, down the road safely and manage kids. And so we've been spending a lot of time this year teaching them some key things and how and behavior cues and how to how to build those relationships and to work with those students and i've shared some videos with the superintendent and others of of my bus drivers uh, interacting with students and situations and i'm very proud of how they handle themselves and they're not the videos you see of the bus driver losing it they're the bus driver maintaining control and so that's a great thing to see um, Paratraining, Canvas training, Chromebook training, uh, key support and information for paras, and how best to work with uh, SPED students. And then driver training. And I wanted to thank you for the two days we had with those professional days that were put into the calendar 
we spent some time with training our drivers and our pairs. So we were able to do mountain driving. So all of our drivers have now gone through a course. It's what, four drivers to one of my trainers, and they actually go and drive over the Sardine Can Canyon up to Harbor Ranch, because that's one of the most frequent routes. And we spend time before they drive, we spend time talking about specific things to be aware of when you're on a mountain road. And so we're hoping that, and we know that will create some dividends for us as we avoid accidents. <laughs> um, urban driving, so we, we haven't met, made that mandatory yet, but we've allowed drivers to sign up and we actually take them down and we have them drive downtown Salt Lake because <laughs> we have field trips down to downtown Salt Lake and events and, and driving a big bus in downtown Salt Lake is far different than driving in Box Elder County. And so we spend some time with that. Defensive driving, we spent a lot of time this year teaching drivers to be defensive, to avoid accidents, because 99% of accidents are driver oriented, not just bus drivers, but either the driver of the bus or driver of their vehicles. Less than 1% is caused by an issue with the bus as far as mechanical. So that's something we're looking at doing. Uh, specific training for drivers involved in accidents. So if we have an accident, I have a committee, we review that accident and then we create a, a guideline of what we would like the trainers to work with them on so they could avoid that accident in the future. And so it's, it's that retraining and helping them. And then uh, we have federally approved new driver training. We were the first in the state to be approved with the new training that uh, we have to have. We're registered with the state to be a CDL training center and a third party tester. And we actually have people reaching out to us wanting to have come to us and we can charge up to $1,700 for that. We haven't opened that up because we've got so many we're trying to do with in-house, but down the road, that's something we're going to look at as we do that. Um, with that said, skills driving as well. We did that and let's go ahead and show this video. And before, as we start, what this is, is we are, this is one-on-one, -on -one, one trainer with one driver. And we set this skills course up, up at the SSC, so the Sports Center in Tremont. So we'll go ahead and, and show this video with this in the world. Let's see how this goes. So this first part is railroad crossing. So we practice um, procedures and how we should approach and deal with a railroad crossing. So the little yellow thing is an imaginary railroad track. Mm -hmm. We created this video so the drivers could see what they were going to be doing. Right turns, so not hitting your tire on that curve, but coming around. Now a left turn and not hitting the cone. So we're going to watch. Let's see if they hit the cone. Uh, nope. So we're good. Now we're going to come in again. And Make sure they don't hit this cone. Oh, yep, we made it. And we used a GoPro to create this video. Slim and trim, so the cones get narrower, so they have to be adjusting and making sure they're not going to hit the cones as they go down this line. So the GoPro on a drone? On a drone, yeah. Yep. You guys have a lot. Fun. We <laughs> are. Actually, this is giving me anxiety. Yeah. Really if you want to come, we will train you. So come on out. <laughs> yep. Uh, this is a right turn, so they're going to turn around this whole radius of this. Uh, um, and again, making sure their tire <laughs> almost. And again, making sure your tire does not hit the white line. With 85 screaming kids. With 85 kids on board. I know. How about parallel parking? It's coming. <laughs> I'm parking in the box. That was the part I aced. I like that part. Coming out, the alley dock is tough. <laughs> so you approach this direction in an alley is that dock. A no. The new buses, we're putting them on, but we're we having them do it without. I can't even use my car anymore without the backup cameras. It's really wow. dang good. 
today. Who's driving? Is this one of This is one of my trainers. Okay. Yeah. Wow. They drew straws to see who had to be the one that was Ooh, with the video. That looks so nice. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you have, you have to make them do both directions. Oh, yeah. And it's all about your mirrors and checking your mirrors and looking where your rear wheel is placed. Look how good she's doing that. Whoops. Oh, this, is a <laughs> this, is a, this is a female driver. Lady driver. That's a better. Yes. Figure eight. Now this is really fun, right? <laughs> and again, not to hit the cone. And if we had a driver that did, we went back and looked at, you know, and, and it was a training moment and then had them go through it. <laughs> we need some jazzy music, probably. No, I need some dramatic effect. Yeah. Now they're going to go backwards through the same course. Oh. How often do they have to do that? Well, this is new this year. We did this because we had this, but we feel like this is honing in those skills um, and when they're driving buses, and critical skills. I think Rob will tell you a lot of our cost from risk management. Little fender bender things like yep. what they're doing right here. Back. Yep. Okay. Tail swing is real. You'll hear that from drivers. You have to watch your tail swing. That's everything that hangs up behind that rear wheel. I don't know. My dad was a bus driver after he retired, and I've seen how he drives. And I don't know how he did the bus. <laughs> <laughs> but he paid more attention when he did that. Please don't watch the oh. videos of him. But like, see this, I'm like, oh. My dad was a bus driver for 17 years, and I was a kid. You believe I never got any insurance from that damn school district? <laughs> That's what I heard for 17 years, and I didn't understand what he meant. Now I do. <laughs> didn't touch any of the cones. Jason, what's the length of that bus? Um, 40, feet. 40 feet. 40 feet. 40 feet. <laughs> So there's that video, but again, we're doing a lot of training and that was just a highlight of one of those. Um, next, I just want to talk about what we have is the greatest issue facing transportation. And that is a driver shortage. It's a national issue. It's a state issue. As I um, was at the conference visiting with uh, other directors, that was, a high, that was the key topic the whole time. Is, is the shortage of drivers and how do we attract drivers? How do we keep drivers? Um, this year, since uh, July 1, uh, we've hired 18 new drivers and we have tremendous new drivers. Nancy followed one through the canyon. <laughs> she was wonderful. Yep. I could not have done without her. And um, I'm just thrilled with all our drivers. But unfortunately, with retirements and resignations, we basically held ground. We didn't gain. And um, with the growth of students this last year, we should have added six additional routes. And I'm continuing to have pressure from parents and people. The buses are overcrowded. We've got to do something. And I would love to add routes. I just don't have drivers. And even with the fact we've hired 18, I still don't have those drivers. With the potential of new growth and the added routes from the new elementary school, um, we need to look at another four to six additional routes. So potentially that's 12 to 14 routes. That's another 12 to 14 drivers that I need to be looking at. Um, Jason, do we have the buses that we need for those routes? I have the buses. I just don't have the drivers. Rod's been really good. <laughs> and uh, we're preparing and, and, and getting those buses, but um, I don't have the drivers. With that said, with continued growth, 
we're going to need to continue buses. And a typical bus is about 130,000. So you look at that, you know, 14 times 130,000, that's an extensive amount of dust and dust. That's more than we're saving with electricity. Well, Rocks had a real good system to replace the buses. Right. And, 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 we're making do, and we're not going to sell any buses this year. Typically, we sell buses at the end of the year. I don't dare because with the growth, I'm not sure that we can do that. Um, preschool and special ed demands are increasing dramatically, and Catherine's here to support me with that. And we we have a wonderful working relationship, and, and we try to make sure we're always keeping those kids going where they need to go. And, and she shared with me for this next year, we're going to have a high demand again and, and more um, a, a demand that way. Extracurricular trips create an issue in keeping routes uh, covered. Uh, some districts are not going to continue to cover those extracurricular events. They're telling uh, schools they're going to have to, or districts, either we do something or you're going to have to privatize. You're going to have to go out to private companies and charter to, to move these, these athletes. And I don't want to go that direction. I value us doing that. And so with that in mind, one of the things that I was able to look at as I talked to other districts and other people involved and people within our own community and principals and the superintendent and, 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 and Carrie and Keith and Rod is I want to look at double runs. And what that means is a driver would be able to do an elementary and a secondary route but we would have to look at adjusting times to do that. And I don't want to be the one that com completely sets that. We're transportation, but I would like to look at working with the Bell team and with uh, the principals and some other stakeholders and as quickly as we can, because we like to do that for this coming year, look at how we could create a separation between the elementary and secondary start times and end times so we could double run. And really, that would give us and buy us a lot of time. It also would bring in, uh, an, a benefit to the drivers because now they're going to have more hours. And that's one of the things is I'm looking to keep people. We need to have, they, they want more hours. They want the benefits. They want insurance, as the superintendent talked about. And so I see that as, as, as our only solution. I, I'm not saying that's it, but I truly see that as a, as a great opportunity that doesn't cost us a great deal. Now, I recognize it creates some burdens and it creates some, some issues that we would have to address and look at. But really, as I talk to other districts, I can only know that we're the only ones that don't double run. And Dave, you would agree? Dave was a past transportation director, so I'm thrilled to have him <laughs> work with him as well next year. But I don't know. I just would like to proceed that direction. I'd like to have a, a, a committee involved in that. And, and, and we work as quick as we can because we're going to do that for this fall. We need to get the word out that those are changes. But honestly, I see this as a win-win. If the federal government mandates uh, daylight savings stays, as the Senate passed and the House, if they approve that, that means in January it won't get light until after 9 o'clock. So that would be another advantage that our elementary kids wouldn't be walking in the dark. Can I ask you just a little bit more details yeah. about that? So, like, right now, I mean, what would the difference be between what we do now and what we would need to do? As so, far as like so it now? really depends on the schools. Some of our elementary schools start really early, so there may need to be almost an hour delay. Some aren't quite that early, and so it may not be as much of an adjustment. Um, as I visit with the elementary principals, and I've got a couple here, they're supporting. They understand what I'm against, and, and so, but I want to work with them. I don't want to just say, we're transportation, we're dictating. dictating yeah. But I also need some way to create that double routing. Um, and it creates those efficiencies, because now the same bus can do two runs. The same driver can do two runs. What about, because we have some non-busing schools. Mm -hmm. Would we, I guess that's my question. Like as, as I talked with the elementary schools, they would want to move with all the others so they're pretty consistent. That was kind of the, the thought I got from them. But yeah, I believe Lakeview, I think Lakeview is the only school that doesn't have a bus. Oh, that's one my kids go to. That's why I don't have stuff. Yeah. Because that principal tells me all the time I never get to work with you, Jason. Yeah. So. 
I visit every school about every other day, so we're... Any other questions? And so, I don't know, Superintendent, what, what your, your thoughts were and what we... Well, I know, you know, it is, it is, a, it is a burden. And so I think that's, you know, I, uh, we debated whether or not to have him throw this at you today. <laughs> but uh, I'd be willing, you know, have a couple board members on this this uh, this committee to try to, do, you know, look at it and make some decisions. So I, I don't know how, how you feel. I think it's a good move. Personally, I think it, I think it saves us money. I think it's it's better retention of bus drivers. I think overall scheduling. I mean, we just went through trying to change the schedule. <laughs> I just, I just, Nobody I just really likes that. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and the dance teachers. That I I mean I think it would be an adjustment, but I think I mean it's a real issue. It's a real issue. Driver shortage is an issue. If we can't get our extracurricular teams where they need to go, and our bus drivers, we can't get the kids where they. I mean, it's just. Oh, and I failed to mention that all my mechanics, my secretaries, and myself are driving buses about every day just to cover, and that would alleviate that problem, too. So, uh, Jason, you want to mention, like, Perry Willard, how they're already double running? So, with, with, with Perry and Willard, they already double run, and that's an advantage for us all right there. So, we wouldn't look to them other than try to keep their schedules close to the other schools. But we already double run that school. And that's where it's such an advantage, because the same drivers and buses pick up um, Perry or, or Three Mile, sorry, and then Willard. So, so when we're, I know you want to do this for fall, um, if, if we can. Do we have a committee that we can meet with the board members on that committee that would be part of that discussion, Connie? Would I, you I would. I would like to. I would like to be a part of that committee. I don't think we have a committee that's no, assigned that necessarily. With someone it's else, talk, yeah. I want some principals and, and yeah. like I said, district. Okay. District. Well, why don't we move in that well, direction, I mean, Connie? I can build some stuff in. Okay. If there's nobody else. Well, well superintendent, will you look yeah. at that and get the group together? Well, we'll this probably the, 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 tomorrow. Does okay. anybody in the board feel like that's a direction we want to move in? Yeah. Okay. I just so, don't want all the calls. I know. Yeah, well, <laughs> you can blame it on the buses. You're okay because yeah. they're already doing it on your end. <laughs> I don't know, but going 20 minutes later yeah. last oh, year, I know, I know sure that people. But when we stay at daylight savings and it's dark till nine o'clock, they may be happy. Yeah, that's what that I'm concerned. I'm really concerned. I am. And I knew Jason. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. I thought last year was a good. Yeah, yeah I know. We all thought it was. I didn't. I didn't know how much I hated daylight savings until I became transportation director and it's dark. <laughs> I don't like it when it's dark because you can't see the kids when I'm driving a bus. They don't dress so you can see them. They're in dark oh. clothes with hoodies and it's scary. It is. Thank yeah. you. Yes. You know, but I think too that as, if we can get this put together rather quickly, yes. it gives people an opportunity, whether it be dance director, instructors, or whoever it is, um, to let them jump on yes. and, and join us in, in providing this service for our students. And it's, as long as we're communicating this early, I think they'll, they can probably make it work. And if they have a big problem, they can come drive for me because I will teach them. I pay them for the whole CDL, $1,700 cost. I give them a signing bonus, pay them for their time, and we will let them drive. Yes, win-win-win. Hey, Jason, yes. Ryan brought back Mike some info. I brought you back two buses. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this one is actually a jump drive. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to jump in and just say how much I appreciate it. Jason has been so enthusiastic about this change, and, and he has. He's had a big learning curve. He's went and got his own CDL so he can drive for us and and uh, looked at things from a different perspective, and we're doing some neat things. He's made some neat changes, I think. So Thank you. Thank you. Present. Yes, honey. And then I, I want to also mention just a little, a few things that I've heard from uh, the North End, and that is that, you know, there's been some questions that have come to me, and, and I always go to the superintendent with it first, and then, of course, he's come to you with it. But the bottom line is, is that we have policies in our district, and Jason has been really good to read those policies, understand them, and apply them and make sure that, that you're following those policies. And then it makes it really easy for us to answer the questions that these 
these uh, wonderful citizens have because we just, we have to adhere to our policies because there's a reason for it. And so thank you for uh, adhering to policy, learning policy, because I know it's brand new, but you've looked at, at your policy manuals and, and you've understood what makes for a safe transportation department. So thank you. Okay, that's just a couple questions. So what benefits do we offer for uh, the drivers? I mean, we can be kind of helping to get this out if we need, but I don't know what to tell So uh, we start at 19 uh, 78 an hour. Uh, once they work five hours, uh, then they get insurance, but it's Keith could answer better what that looks like. Yeah, 25 a week. 25 a week. No, I mean insurance, what they get. But. Oh, well, then depending on it's a sliding scale of 25 to 32 to 35 to 37 to 40. So depending on, I could, you guys want to say it or do you? I'm just, that. in summary, what, what can we do to try and help get the word out there? What? So, so it's. So you get to work with wonderful kids. You get to drive a big bus. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we start at 1978 an hour. We, we pay for all the training. Um, we do have a signing bonus. Um, and then if they stay with us, they get a bonus for staying with us after a period of time. Um, if we do double run, most of my drivers will get insurance then. And so that would create that aspect. So. Karen, I was talking with uh, Tyler Vincent, who is mayor of Brigham, and we were commis well, we were actually the church function, but we were commiserating about employees talking about buses, and I was saying, our drivers are getting 19 an hour, and he said, you're kidding, our policemen are getting 18. And they're dealing with more than 84 different bus. So I just think we've, we've really put some emphasis in this, and we're giving salaries that a lot of people don't get another profession. But I was stunned when he said Brigham Policeman get eighteen dollars an hour to start. Okay. Well just help try and get the word out there. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? No, you're doing a fabulous job, thanks. And I know those buses are like I said, it gives me anxiety just watching <laughs> that. I could never do that. So great job getting your CDL too and be willing to do that. All right, um, Ashley, you're back on. Chinese dual language support plan. Okay. No worries for me today. But last month we had um, some parents come with some concerns about our Chinese dual immersion program. And so I met, met with the BELT team a few weeks ago and we kind of hammered out a plan. So we did share that with those concerned parents this morning and let them know what we're doing. <laughs> um, we did meet with those parents this morning so that they knew what our plan was, but we wanted to let you know what our direction was as well. So we kind of put this into three different people that we are supporting. So the first one is our students. Um, we are committed to do, doing a better job with our recruitment for our dual immersion programs. Um, more advertising about the program. You know, we have been sending out the emails and the texts and the phone calls and things like that, but making sure it's in the paper, making sure that all the school principals are getting all that information out so that people know exactly when the application um, process is open and the lottery and things like that. The other fun thing we wanted to do is um, make a recruitment video with our own district students of them. I'll go around and video the different grade levels, um, activities that they're doing so that we can show the parents and those little kindergartners who are applying to the program um, what the program's all about and why it's awesome to learn a new language. So we're excited about that project. Um, Chinese New Year historically has been a big deal at Foothill Elementary and they do a big thing every year. Um, and then as the kids have gotten a little bit older, it's kind of fizzled out a little bit in the upper grades. Um, at the high school did have a cool Chinese New Year thing that they did this year. But I've already met with the Chinese teachers and we thought, let's just do a big district Chinese New Year bash so that it's all of the Chinese um, students all together that they can do um, activities, they can share with each other and celebrate together. We also wanted to make sure that we're including the Spanish in this. It was the Chinese parents that came to us with the concern, but the Chinese dual immersion or the Spanish dual immersion students deserve these same fun activities too. 
So we would like to put together something fun for the Spanish as a culminating district-wide celebration well, as well. Mayo. I'm sorry, what's that? Cinco de Mayo. We thought about that, that but that's, that's just in Mexico. Well, uh, I think well, more people in America celebrate than Mexico. Right. Mexico. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's an end of the year. Yeah, yeah, that would be a great thing to do in May. It's yeah. a good time of year to do it. Would, would this also, I think, I think that'd be a good recruiting tool. Like you invite exactly. the students that are not involved, like with the yeah. you know, kindergarten, like to spread the word about it. I think that would be great. To get the kids excited. I agree. Um, we also talked about the collaboration among schools, and I think that's something that one of them brought up, I believe, in the board meeting, is, you know, Box Elder Middle School and Golden Spike now are going to be really close together. And the intermediate school and the high school are pretty close together. So could we have the older students maybe once a trimester go and visit those younger students and do an activity with them and maybe read with them and just do some things so, again, those younger students can see, this is my goal. Look at how cool these big kids are that can do these awesome things. So we'll set that up. Um, Chinese club was something that they asked for, and luckily um, John Zing, who is the teacher at Box Elder High School, has already got the ball rolling with the Chinese club. So he's got some great ideas. Uh, when I pulled the Chinese teachers together to talk about a club, kind of district-wide, their thought was, I don't know if the high schoolers would really want to come if we were inviting first and second graders too. Just saying, um, might not be so fun for them anymore. But we thought if we um, really focused on it with our teachers at the secondary level, and then as we shared that information with the teach or with the parent group this morning, they actually offered that they would run one at Golden Spike for the younger kids, and they would bring in some activities. We would just need a district employee to be there to kind of supervise, but the parents are willing to kind of take that on for the younger kids, and then we'll have our high school teachers do it with the older kids. Um, um, as far as the teachers, and this is something that we would do with any teacher, really, just a, an in-depth plan for coaching for teachers that are struggling in any area. And um, our direction that we thought we would go to was I will go in, I will take a more active role in the coaching of these dual immersion teachers, and I'm actually starting tomorrow morning, I'll be a young intermediate working with the principals over there and just going into those classrooms, we will use our state dual immersion observation tool that the state's provided us with that says, this is what you should see in a dual immersion classroom. So I'll be training the principals on that more in depth um, so that they know when they go into a classroom what they're looking for. I've noticed that sometimes, depending on the principal, um, it can be a little intimidating to go in and observe a dual immersion class when they're speaking Chinese or they're speaking Spanish and I don't speak Spanish and so I don't really know how to give the teacher feedback. Um, but also good teaching is good teaching and you can tell if the teacher has classroom management and has a good relationship. You can tell if the kids are engaged and they're all working and doing something and talking to each other in that communication together. So I'll be guiding the principals through um, that process. Um, let's see, and then we're just going to continue to have more district-wide collaboration opportunities. And you were thanked earlier for putting those professional development days into the schedule, but that's been such a help also for our dual immersion teachers. So we've used the last two, day, or the last two days um, of professional development time, and I've gotten all the Chinese teachers together where we've looked at our, our district-wide data and showing like, great, look, we're doing so well with our reading until about fifth grade and then we're dropping. So what are we going to do as a district team to help support? Um, they're sharing teaching strategies of, this is how I'm getting kids to talk in class. And this is how I'm getting kids to learn how to write. And this is how we're, how we're reading together. So they're, you know, the answer is always in the room, I feel like. And we've got some amazing teachers that can share their ideas with others to help each other improve. And that's the whole idea of professional learning communities. So we're just trying to build our dual immersion professional learning communities as well. Um, as far as our concerns about the, the Chinese teachers not really understanding the U.S. culture and our educational practices and our grading, things like that. Um, I have a phone call tomorrow with Stacy Lyon, who is the state dual immersion Chinese coordinator. And she always does trainings with the new teachers that are coming into the country. And so I'm going to talk to her about her ideas because obviously we're not the only district that does Chinese. 
there's got to be issues in other districts too. So I'm going to kind of pick her brain for ideas of how we can help, how she can support us from the state level to help those teachers really understand the culture that they're coming into and so that we can support them in knowing what's expected as well. Um, as far as the parents, um, anything that they have as far as Chinese activities, Chinese club, we've committed to help them just get the word out. So we're going to have our IT people help us get some um, groups together so that we can push out texts to all the Chinese secondary or all the Chinese elementary um, families so that they know what's going on and um, just support them in that way. They so, mentioned group me. Yes, they wanted to do a group me, a parent group me that they just kind of run on their own so that um, if we you know, push out information on if you would like to talk to a parent um, who maybe is wondering about how my child's going to be able to do band and do dual immersion when they go to secondary school. You can get on that little group me and say, hey, does anyone have experience with this? And have other parents be able to say, well, this is what we've done with my child and this is what we've done. So not necessarily that we'll be doing as a district, but that's their idea and we'll help get their information out of that this is available for you if you would like to be a part of it. Okay. Any questions? So when you met with the parents this morning, yeah. they felt like that this addressed most of their concerns? I think they did. I think we left think the meeting the this morning. And, and kudos to Ash, but the fact that it was already put in place and they looked at it and went, oh, you've kind of addressed our issue. It was and exactly they were, the they same were happy about that. four or five that were here. Yes. And they, I was really happy with their response and their ideas and, and their, their thankfulness. Yes. And so I think it was a really good meeting. It was a positive meeting for sure. Thank so, you. Okay. So, one, so funding, uh, do we have any kind of idea of what this is going to cost? Are we expecting the parents and the schools to put something together? What, so what as far do you anticipate? Mm -hmm. As far as Chinese club, they would ask, like most clubs ask for like a $5 donation, a $10 donation to get materials together to do a club. Um, I do have a little bit of dual immersion funding that I get from the state that we could maybe use for busing to, you know, do from school to school to do those once a trimester um, activities, things like that. Um, I've talked to Gary a little bit about maybe that's something the foundation could help us with. Um, so we're looking into some funding and even some of those moms said that they had ideas for community helpers that could maybe donate if they felt like this was an exciting thing to do. One of the things that I think was really positive in that meeting is the, the group of ladies that just said, we found out when we want to do these activities, we have to pay building rental. And as we're together as a group, if the, the policy says if there's an employee that can be the supervisor, then that can take away the building rental. And so those were things that they felt really supported with and they said we have a lot of paras who have kids in the program that we, we know we can get them to help so there was that conversation there was the one where again what we've observed tonight in our, our meeting from just patrons but a couple of those ladies just said we we can do the technology we'll we'll run the, the facebook post or one lady said once you get somebody in pta present she'll Mm -hmm. take on and plan the parties and be there. So I think it was a really good feeling of just working together. But we did solve the building rental uh, issue, I believe. I'm making it a club. By following our club policy. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I've been, I've been letting this have a 15-year-old in Chinese, and I think this is amazing. You've done a great job on it. And you've covered all of the challenges that we face as a parent. So thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah, in a month. That's thank amazing. you. Thank you for well, it's not all done yet. It's in the plan, but I'll be on it. You know, I really appreciate the the quick response and the plan. So it's in place for next year. So thank you right. and for the leadership team for taking the time to do that. I think that speaks a lot to our parents that we, we listen and we, we care about them and we're trying to be transparent in what we're doing and how we're doing it and what, what what's best for students. So. Just, can I just interject real quickly? Oh, sure. Because this is the part of the, the, the program where people start to fall off. And before they all leave, I just, 
you know, Rod said a couple things, but it's obvious that we have a really good group of people. And we had director's meeting just today, had a great discussion about some of these things we're talking about, but it's really a joy to work with this group of people because they work hard, they're, they're out of the box thinkers, they are looking at the positive side of things, and so it's just really a, really a positive thing. I, you know, I know Rod's going to go on to bigger and greater things, but I think Dave should be pretty excited from what he's heard tonight, so be part of this. So really, really cool to be a box elder school district person. Thank you, Superintendent. All right, Rod, you're on monthly financial report. Um, I'm just, I'm impressed that you had a couple of, a couple of your people with the here that are willing to, to help you solve the problems. Isn't I that, am too. Isn't that yeah. fantastic? I was thinking, wow, that's cool. So they weren't, they weren't just bringing you problems, but they're willing to help solve them. So, uh, financial report. Um, we're, we're getting to the winding up scene on this, and uh, things look pretty good. Uh, we've collected most of our property taxes for the year. Um, we had a quite a fall off in other just miscellaneous income over the COVID space of time. It looks like that's starting to come back. Um, it looks like our uh, expenses compared to the budget or and compared to last year are looking pretty pretty good where they should be. We have a couple of those that I've marked in yellow that are ESSER funds that I didn't budget for because I didn't know where we were going to spend the money when I didn't budget. And they we like colors in the budget showing where there's been changes. And he's not <laughs> colorblind, so that would be good. So give us colors. <laughs> and um, as we go down through things, we, we've talked about most of these things, but today we were, we've were we been going through budgets with directors today. And if you'll notice down on line um, 82, we well, talked about that today. Uh, if you'll look at that, it, I budgeted $505,000 for, for fuel, for buses. And uh, we've already spent 491,097%. We all know why that's mm -hmm. happening. We figure that my budget's about $180,000 short this year. So we'll have to increase that. That'll be an increased cost. It'll be something that uh, we'll have to account for as we're finalizing the budget. Um, uh, then we did. Uh, we did talk a little bit about, we talked about food today too, and the, the cost of food is up, and that's down in, that's down on line, what are we, line 193 shows, last year we spent 55% of our budget, this year we spent 77% of our budget, so you can kind of see what's happening got some hot spots with expenses as we went through transportation today. Our lubricants and oil costs are up. Same thing, how much is the oil? Five dollars a quart now, something like that. So twenty to thirty percent increase. So we're seeing huge increases there. So we're gonna have to account for some of those things as we look at, at the next year's budget. If any of you have inside track on what fuel prices will do next year. I'd be interested to know wow. that. I, I really don't even know how to estimate that this year. So anyway, uh, after being in California and paying six twenty nine a gallon. <laughs> anyway, it's crazy. But anyway, we're it's looking pretty good. This is the time of year where things start to show up for my budget debt where I had budget problems from a year ago, I'm trying to budget at this time when I don't know everything that's going on. But, uh, it starts to show up in the budget. And since we really don't, I typically don't open the budget at mid-year. Usually, some districts do open the budget at mid-year. There's a few hot spots, so I haven't done that. If it's, there's a lot, 
who may want to do that in the future or bring it up and change the budget. But usually I do the final for this year with next year's budget. And uh, we'll be working uh, through the process in the next month and to try to keep you afraid. Oh, I have. Well, good. Thank you, Rod. Is it, are there any questions for Rod? I was just wondering, um, on the the turf, didn't we approve that prior to the budget last year? I was just wondering why that wasn't included in the budget. I no, know the turf all happened after I budgeted. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, I thought we approved it like in February last year uh, to go with the, the turf. No, I think that's all happened in this year. Because it was, it's all separate in my budget. It wasn't budgeted for. So, uh, the collections on the turf, so far we're right at three hundred thousand of the four hundred and sixty thousand, roughly that that they had promised to donate. No, I'm, I'm sure they're good for their work. The, I just thought the we 60%. made the, the decision back in February last year to go ahead and do this. Year. And why that wasn't included in the budget. I mean, no, it's something that came up this year. I don't remember exactly when Tremont came in. But it was ready for the school year in November. No, no, it, it was, wasn't until no, like, was like almost October. October. Yeah, yeah. It was, they didn't play any first games on it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember it was like when they weren't sure if they could do it fast. I think maybe, maybe <laughs> it was right about the beginning of the year. I don't think. I don't recall oh, it. Was it wasn't in my No, it wasn't yeah, planning on it. Was I, Corey? Before. We weren't planning on it. No. I don't know. I, For some reason, I didn't I don't know remember. Well, they had talked about it, and one gentleman wanted to get his money in and have the taxes. And yeah. so I think that was an end of the year, or an end of the tax year thing. I'd have to go back and look at that. Yeah, I didn't else. put it in the budget. And I was, think we had gotten some pricing. Yeah, on and his money just went into the foundation like, yeah. until we could move it, but I don't think any of it I think we were waiting for a decision from the board to sit back until after budget time. So it's not, it's not in there, but we do have that much in collection. So. Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay, thank you, Rod. All right, let's go to our policy review. We just have one policy to delete and a first reading on one. So let's look at the policy review. Are there any questions on that? Um, just one comment on the policy to, to delete. Um, in, when, when we put the agenda together, could we make a note on why we're deleting the policy somewhere? Because I, I, I uh, pull that up and I see that it's deleted, but there's no reason. Reasoning. Okay. That would be helpful for me. That's a good idea. Carrie, can you tell us why we are deleting this? Yes, school? because T we don't do total um, improvement time. TSSA replaced that. Okay. So our, when we took the TSSA response, we don't do another plan that that just replaced the school improvement plan. So really just delete that. But we can just do that. We can do that when we delete it. That's a good idea. Exactly why that's then people that. will remember. Yeah. Like, yeah. Because it does, like, why aren't you having <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, Even for us, yeah. we're reviewing Absolutely. the agenda, yeah. and we don't have to ask the question all the time. Yeah. 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 That's good. Okay, do we want to make a motion on this, or do we want to include first reading as well? Do them both. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so first reading. Make life easy Okay, we'll make life easy, life easy for Rod. Because he only has like two months, 17 days, 14 hours now. <laughs> so, um, are there questions on the first reading, the student and staff acknowledgments due to death? I'd, I'd like to hear from the committee what the, the what they were thinking. I mean, to me, it looks like we're putting it on the principal, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of some rationale, what the thoughts were, why we're deleting the, the one. So when we talk, um, so when we talked about this, and Tiffany uh, was the other board member that was there, and her son is opening his mission board right now. So that's why she's far home. But as we talked through this, uh, we tried to we tried to figure out a way to help kids be able to 
not celebrate but acknowledge death and passing without making it a big to do and we hated to put into writing that you know a small acknowledgement can be held not knowing what that would be two or three years down the road and what if we and help me um, those in the, in yeah. the administration we, we tried to come up with something that would help kids uh, as he said in some some when they've had kids size like everybody wore green that day just to just to help acknowledge that that was a certain kids or a certain child's favorite color um, anyway we thought if we had the principal be the one that had to approve that then we could keep some control in setting up instead of us trying to write specifically in policy you may have one class where everybody sits around and talks about the student but two days of something else we, we tried to make it something that would be fluid and useful but that would help to have some controls and the principal in each building knowing what's going on. Does that help? And yes, it puts it on the principal, but A.J. Gilmore was there from Bear River and, and he was saying really he felt like he wanted to be in the loop and wanted to know obviously what was happening. And anyway, that, that put it, it put squarely on the principals and, and the Bell's team said they will do extensive training, talk to the principals about how to control this, what to do, because it is going to be a procedure thing as much as anything. But trying to write in policy, it was very difficult, but we wanted kids to be able to recognize and acknowledge that someone important to them has died without being too onerous. Does that help? Is that well, I, I think what Nancy's saying is, is true, but I think AJ being on that committee, which he's, <clears throat> he just is this year, and uh, Carol. Carol is. Carol. I was trying to think who the elementary was. But as we talked about it, it just it, there was just the feeling that there needs to be some avenue for the children to acknowledge and, and basically mourn. And we felt like it is going to behoove the district level to have a training every year and talk about this and even though it's on the principal they are they're gonna, they will work with their supervisor and we're going to have a good discussion prior to allowing these there's a lot of things that are actually grassroots things that kids end up doing without actually getting permissions so we felt like if we and sometimes they do that because they know we won't let them <laughs> sometimes they just do it and so we felt like if we did this acknowledgement it would it would uh you know, probably cut down on any of the, the big things that we're really concerned about. You know, uh, the, the, the placards on the wall, uh, you know, the, the memorial thing, trees, those types of things. So that, that was kind of my thing. Keith, you, I just thought, if, so think about if the red was black, okay? Because that was part of the old policy. Yeah. Right. So start off with a box of the school that she recognizes the need to appropriately recognize students and employees. So as a board, we're like, we want people to recognize them. And then if one was black, we go right into, don't do that, yeah. and don't do that, and really we don't offer anything of substance till the end of the policy. Mm -hmm. By flipping and saying, look, we can acknowledge things. We can write letters and give to the, the passing. Think about Betty Down, 40 years of Century Elementary. All, I mean, generations, multiple. And now they want to do something. Can we do something? No, 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 no. But maybe a, a quick letter or come sign a banner at lunch. We give to the family. We acknowledge, that's our first thing we say, we appropriately recognize students and employees. We do that first, but we also stay away from some of the outlandish, potentially, uh, precedents that you set that now, you know, I thought it was a nice way to still be able to yeah. honor, acknowledge, recognize, and not take away some of these people that have these moments. Because most of these are children driven. So when they go, hey, they come in and say, principal, blah, 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 what can we do? What can I do? And to thwart sort of that a little bit. Now, you don't want to disrupt the school, but then that's where I think the principal can say, hey, is this going to be disruptive? Can we do it here? Can we do this before school? And a lot of times it's just grassroots efforts anyway, and maybe Sean, you can speak to this, but 
sometimes, like the senior class, they just say, let's just send it out in our text and let's all do this for them. Am I right on that? Yeah. Well, the senior group chat is never a good idea. Well, no, 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 no. But they do somehow find a way that they're all doing something in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know well, what I'm saying? Well, it's often students who, who are initiating that because of a, of a teacher or, a, or an advisor or someone they look up to. Gotcha. And one of the changes that I felt was really big was calling it acknowledgement rather than memorial. Because we wanted them to be able to acknowledge that something has happened and not make it a big to-do, a big, it's got to be a memorial. We looked up a lot of words. But um, <laughs> anyway, we felt like acknowledgement was a way. Because there had been some concern that in a, as teachers, are, our people are given things in retirement. They're like, well, gee, somebody's died. Why can't we do the same thing for them that someone who's retired and not? And so we tried to kind of make it a division that this is an acknowledgement of their death. And so it was a great conversation. It was so it was well, the, the uh, group that came from Bear River. Did this make it so they could do what they wanted? I I just wondered. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, it um, did. Mm -hmm. it did. Um, I believe it's Monday. It's April twenty fifth, Monday. Two weeks. Yeah. Yes, they're actually it is. they're actually going to, to to have that acknowledgement at the first. I believe it's the first home. Their first the girls' first home game. Yeah. At Bear River. So yes. Okay. One right. of one of the things that I want to mention is when I read this and I heard that it was going to be principal approval. One of the things I felt really good about is, believe it or not, our communities are all different. And I've lived in at, and in Bear River for almost forty five years. And I'm going to tell you that. It's different. And so this allows the principal to, to look at our, every principal gets to look at their community and determine what is the best thing to do for that community because that principal has now connected and understands how this community functions. Because I can tell you that Bear River is totally different than Fox Elder. Totally different. And and in, at Bear River, the school is a major central part of our community. It is the central. The whole it's it's so important to our community. And and so this kind of helps because that principal can can make that determination. Which well, I and really it also about. makes it an age appropriate situation. As we talked about, a middle school uh, soccer player that was killed. Um, anyway, it makes it age appropriate for the kids that they're dealing with it and can work through it that way. Yeah. And then if our principals are, whoa, this one seems a little out of my, yeah. then we can go ahead and talk to other yeah. district leadership and say, hey, how do you feel yeah. about this yeah. and get some guidance from them to be wise? I have, I have a concern, and the policy may cover this, I don't know. Um, you know, you always hear about the kids that are very most popular. You hear about maybe a football coach. You may not hear about, you know, an aide in the classroom or something. And, and I just feel that everybody's important. And, and, you, and if they're going to write a letter to one, I think they need to write a letter or whatever, which they could do to everyone. Because I, I just think that's a real key and very important. I... I think on that way, from my experience, student government is always sensitive to anyone that passes. Uh, so that is automatically taken on by student government. Uh, I, I think, again, it's an individual thing. By, you're right, there might be some that are excluded, but as far as the office of the school and the student government, I don't think there's a student that is missed. No, I, I just think they need to be aware of that. And, and I think we are. And I think this policy could cover that. Whole I guess I, I just wanted to second that. You know, there might be students that are a little bit more um, outgoing right. that might garner a lot more than somebody who is um, maybe a little bit more introverted. But mm -hmm. families need to be equal. That's so right. I would just want to make sure that it is applied equally. That's one of the problems, you know, with this. You just have to, it has to be how it handles so delicately. And 
there is an 800 pound grill in the room and it's suicide and it's something that has to be you know handled delicately but there still needs to be some acknowledgement without glorification of, of the act because that's one of the things that we all worry about is that some student might go well geez that kid never got any um, you know appreciation or got any notoriety until they did this you know sad thing that they did uh, maybe this is my chance to get honored and so that's something that's to me that is the biggest worry in this thing I I do worry about somebody getting more notoriety than somebody else but but the the suicide is is really a, a concerning thing that we've, we've got to really you know handle delicately You ready for a motion? Yeah, I just want to thank the policy committee for spending time on that and really Absolutely. looking into the details and the wording because I think it is a significant uh, policy that we need to, and I was grateful for the very team that came and approached us. That I think they, they went about it the right way, so hopefully in the future they know what the policy is and students can approach their principles. So. Yeah, I'm satisfied with the discussion. Great discussion. Appreciate all the input. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I'll move we approve policy 1545, acknowledgments of uh, student debt. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion by Nancy Kennedy. We and need, somebody needs to move. Oh, and add move. to delete the other one. The delete one, too. Oh. We need to motion for both of them. I move to delete policy 20, whatever the heck it no, was. 40, 40, 40, 40. 40. Okay, so we have a motion by Nancy to delete policy 4005 and to approve 5045. And then I heard two seconds. So. I'll, I'll second the amended motion. Okay, so Brian will second the motion. motion. We all straight, deleting one, approving the other. Okay, yeah. all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And we did struggle too with putting death in the title. We talked about that for 20 minutes <laughs> um, because we felt like that it needed to address what we were actually talking about. So that was also a very good. Discussion. Thanks for taking the time to do that. I think that that honors the people. Like I'm excited for the very River team to be able to do that. And hope moving forward that will be good. All right, board discussion items, board graduation assignments. So, as the you saw the past graduation assignments, I kind of went through and I know Tiffany is planning on speaking at Bear River High School. Wade spoke seven times last year, so he's off the hook for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh. The sunrise, they had to do it. They had seven separate. <laughs> he told me, he told me, he said, just oh, I want to make you know. Oh. I spoke seven times this year. So, so we have Box Elder High School and um, Sunrise High. And the, I noticed that the past five years, Karen and myself have only spoken once, and Clyde is new. So, of the three of us, <laughs> 80 volunteers. Two of you and two of two. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go and listen to you two, so I'll do it next year. <laughs> there you go. Okay. I was just wondering if there's anybody that had um, any graduates at Box Elder? Not this year, no. I spoke last year at Box Elder. Do you want to speak at Sunrise? Yeah. You'll do Sunrise? Unless somebody else wants to, I, this is a good way. <laughs> this is a good initiation right here, Sunrise. I'm happy to, but I, I did speak last year. So oh, well, you're dodging it nicely. It's your turn to speak. You are I'd be happy this. to speak. But no, I spoke last year. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you well, I know. It. I'd be happy to speak. I just don't want to. Clyde, do you want to speak? Julie, you have a senior next year. Right? No, I've got two years till I have a senior. I no, I'm happy to speak. I just know I spoke last year, so I didn't want to overdo it. Yeah. Over it. It's not. <laughs> it's a very simple, like the shorter the better. <laughs> the accept the graduates, Accepting it. You know the principal. You know we, we can definitely go through it and make sure that it's. You want me to sunrise speak at Bear River and you speak at Sunrise? No. Tiffany has a graduate. Oh, sorry. Box Elder. Sorry, yeah. I'm so sorry. Sorry. I'm so you spoke at Box Elder. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm kind of out. I'll, I'll speak of either. Do you want to do Sunrise? Okay, so Clyde will do Sunrise. I'll, I can do Box Elder. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. I know. Welcome, Thank Karen. you for being willing. Well, I'm happy. If you... <laughs> <laughs> so that, did 
I just say I'm Fox Elder? Yes. 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 Julie Taylor, Fox Elder's graduation. Fox Acceptance Elders. of graduates. Okay. Thank you for coming. We accept you. Goodbye. <laughs> no, Are they going to do that. the graduation? They might cheer the most for that, huh? What are the dates? You know, I don't know. Okay, so the dates on graduation, they're down at the bottom of the agenda. We've got Bear River. Box Elder is May 31st at D Event Center. Bear River is June 1st at, oh, we're doing it on the field. Is that right? Oh, that's, good. that's new from this morning. Field. And as we said, I didn't see that earlier. And then Sunrise is June 16th. And are they doing like they're, they did last year? In they're groups? going to have to do it at Fox Elder High, but last I talked to okay. Jack, and they just have too many graduates, so that's a good problem. That is a good problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that'll be at Fox Elder High. Okay. okay. Any other questions on graduation assignments? All right. Okay, NSBA conference review. Um, could everybody give me one takeaway? That from the conference that something that's and I'll start with um, Tiffany told me hers was transparency. She went to a few workshops and said, you know, how being communicating with the communities and the stakeholders <coughs> and being transparent and ways that we can do that. And I, I kind of that was what I was going to talk about too. I went to one where they talked about having an annual report that we like a flyer or something that we send out to everybody, not just parents, but to everybody that's in the community because we do have community members that don't have children or grandchildren in the schools and it's good to help them understand what to do and build a, a relationship with our community members. So that was kind of my takeaway and something that we could actually do now. So and in the spirit of giving I have the Palo Alto yes. School District. Theirs and they instead of putting their annual report, oh, yes. they called it their annual stewardship. It's all yours, Madam Chair. Oh gracias. Okay, so annual stewardship, that is, that's good. So that's and something we that we also, look at. as we were walking back and forth to the conference, we talked about is we're trying to put a bond together that the more everybody in our communities knows what's going on, the best business will be. And the need and the reasoning, and the, I think really being really transparent about why we're doing things and not just, because I, I, think that's a, I think that's a big thing with, you know, nobody wants to pay more taxes, nobody wants to do more things, and, but if you can explain the reasoning behind a lot of things, you get a lot more buy-in than just whatever. And obviously, it just takes time to build those relationships. Do we, it's funny you mention that, because this is one I, I, we're all talking about the same thing, but maybe to add to it, <clears throat> um, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about building more schools and being that support. One of the things that um, they did to help in that area specifically is getting those retirees and you know, people that don't have kids in school in the schools helping and recruiting them to help and, and then they're invested yeah so i like that yeah. Mike? uh i attended a lot of good sessions i guess the one that stuck out in my mind was the modeling civility in your school district and it boil it all down it starts with us we are role models, and we need to remember that and act accordingly. And if we're decent, then we can expect our people here to be decent. And, they, and I think they will be if, yes. if we are. That's what I got. Thank you. I was really impressed with the two public comments we had tonight. They did, weren't just complaining. They're like, this is the problem I see, and here's a solution. I was like, And I got barricades. And I got, I'll help you. I love that. I'm like, I love it. I love it. OK, anybody else? I'll, I'll mention, um, I went to the civility one as well, and, and it seemed like as we were, uh, as we were going to, as I went to the conferences, everyone's struggling with the same things throughout the nation. And, but there was, um, we, we attended the Richard Nixon, uh, that's it. We went to Richard Nixon of uh, a library, and this quote ties in beautifully with civility, and this is what it said. In these difficult years, America has suffered from a fever of words. We cannot learn from one another until we stop shouting at one another. Richard Nixon. He said that. Uh, this was a great big placard. It was wow. a big placard, and it was one of his major statements. And so for me, it's so important, whether I'm here or in city council, wherever I'm at, 
we got to quit shouting because we cannot hear one another when we're doing that. So anyway, Good. it was incredible. Thank you. Also, speaking of speech, I went to three uh, First Amendment law and uh, school board stuff. I, I guess that's kind of my thing. Uh, and it was very interesting as they talked about First Amendment and free speech and who can speak and what all. So a couple of things I talked about specifically. Um, you cannot use free speech as a weapon. And so as we have people that are trying to make us do things or force us, they we have to, they can't use it as a weapon. And um, and also when they talked about the cheerleader that said things off and they talked about uh, local parentis, the position that we have is keeping the kids are in the classroom and in our control what we can do in place of parents. But student, student free speech may be regulated if it impacts the rights of others. And we are all, and we can only be in charge of kids when they're with us and we are not in charge of them. 24-7, so the parents need to get involved on some of this because we have limits on what we can do. And my favorite one was Dr. Godfrey at, uh, at uh, Jordan School District does a weekly podcast, and it was the coolest thing, and I've already got a title for Steve's. We're going to call it Notes from Steve, and have a good time to <laughs> But um, he, goes into the, he goes all around the district and, and, and gets... Snippets, they keep it at 23 minutes because that's how long they were able to time parents who are in carpool lanes. And they do all kinds of, they have put all kinds of information, the, the dashboard for things running in the district and what they're doing, and then just good things that are happening. And, and the superintendent goes out and interviews, interviews people, and, and the superintendent was in that one. And it was, it was exciting. I mean, their, their numbers are huge as people that are listening and 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 on this podcast. Anyway, it was it was really I've I've already talked to Robert about helping me from the IT end, so we are pretty excited about giving it a go and getting it figured out. He he knows the Jordan what is the guy that you know there? Well I know Jared Covelli, he's in curriculum and I've already talked to him and he's given me their communications guy so we can get their workflow and it's Sandy Reese Craft. It's Sandy Reese Craft. Is the one that there's that's the not the name channel. that he gave me. But. Uh, there was three there. Yeah. I mean, it's like you know, they had a communications director and an assistant communications director, and then another guy. And that's the yeah. positions, of course, that we don't yeah. have. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and those are those yeah. I don't pre presume are positions we're going to have. So no, we'll just kind of that's fill a good in. presumption. Unless Dave's got a secret bottom line. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I would much rather have other positions. Yeah. So at the at the academy in the fall. We had a presentation from the communication directors that do, because Granite has one, the big districts yeah. have one. Mm -hmm. And they said at that meeting, they will help any district that wants help in, in, in their communications. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And these professionals will come yeah. in and help us. Yeah. So I think that's great. So I, I mean, just the contact and the things they're getting with their people is amazing. Yeah, I, I was really excited about it. Of course, we all went because Earl. A lot of Utah people were there, and he was so appreciative. But just uh, an FYI, Anthony Godfrey is uh, a new member of Superintendents of Rock. So <laughs> he plays the guitar, and he's quite crafty, so it's going to be kind of funny. I've got to know him. He's a pretty unique. It's funny because he looks just like uh, Super Nintendo in the show. Uh, what is the cartoon that comes He's really blonde. Yeah, and he looks just like Super Nintendo. Super Nintendo. Who? It's it's a it's a regular TV series. Uh, it comes on every night before Seinfeld. So I'm, I'm a late night person. <laughs> on Fox 13. Okay. Anybody know what? <laughs> oh boy, I'm not going to watch that. Time for TV. Just a Super Nintendo. Especially not. I'll be up till about two or three watching because after five hours of adrenaline, you just can't sleep anyway. Yeah. Well, they call theirs the supercast. Yeah. Because it's the superintendent, and he has a lot of taking, pulling his shirt aside with an S on his chest. Or J. Anyway. It's a J. Oh, is it a J? Yeah. J. Oh, oh, Jordan, I thought, Jordan. oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wade, did you have? Well, I, I just really enjoyed um, the second day opening sessions, the two gentlemen that um, had the book about Mr. Rogers. I just thought that was so positive and good, especially for, for kids. Uh, 
It says, uh, first of all, to trust kids, to be curious, to show kids that their questions matter, to create safe, warm, uh, nurturing spaces, start with what's familiar, and then model curiosity. And their book is When You Wonder, You're Learning, and that's what Mr. Roger used to say. And, and actually, you can find that book on Amazon. I checked it out. It's 1895. <laughs> But uh, I, I just thought it was just really just right on and what we need to teach kids about being curious, about being kind and loving them. And then they become adults that way. So. Yes. I love that too. Great. Thank you. So good. Frank? Um, I went to the presentation on uh, electric school buses. And it's not a matter, if you pass that to Rod and eventually to Dave, Dave um, it's not a matter of, of if, it's when. Eventually, we'll go. I don't know if it's now, but um, I asked whenever they got the solar panels on top of the school bus, and they said that's a ways out yet, but you got to keep an eye on that. And just one additional thing, um, Carrie, I, I went to a presentation by the the um, curriculum director um, for uh, the national school board, and she talked about research that she had done um, where many districts throughout the country are not teaching algebra one in the eighth grade um and and she said she was chinese she said that people are asking her all the time how come chinese are so smart in math she says it's because they start earlier and so i was just curious um in our district where are we where are we teaching algebra one <laughs> everything is we're, we're, integrated now yeah, we're Math is not, so math right now, I can speak to this as a math teacher, the math right now is that it's integrated, so it's not, it's not algebra, geometry, trigonometry, calculus anymore, it is all, you learn algebra, geometry. But is it, is it in eighth grade, or what? what I think in math, first well, grade. my, what? There's concepts. Down into elementary. Yeah, I was going to say, my sixth grader has been learning algebraic concepts in her math six okay. class. So, but it's not identified necessarily, they don't call it algebra. But they're they're teaching them the concepts of like they don't call it a variable necessarily, but what's the missing part or things like that. And so it's the approaches. It's not so like when I taught a long time ago when I started teaching, it was pre-algebra, algebra, algebra two, geometry. And was it about twelve years ago? I think Mary Kay was here when that Utah's been Utah changed, changed it. If you go okay. outside of Utah, you will hear algebra and geometry when. Um, you have to fill out those reports from the um, year we just got done filling yeah. out. What is it? I can't believe I forgot. OCR. How could I ever forget that? OCR report. CRDC. 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 Sorry. So that's CRDC. another one that's on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> How I could ever forget that? I don't know. Anyway, CRDC. It, all the reports, like we just have to kind of make it work because the report actually says algebra, algebra one, geometry. The other state requirements. Yeah, but this is state, uh, Utah Core. So maybe, maybe we're ahead of the curve. Yeah. Yeah. So really when you go and hear any national speaker outside of Utah, you will still hear that terminology. Okay. They did the Utah thing in the math one, math two, math three, yeah. it's those concepts that integrated that. There were, there were other states, but not not all the states. No, it's not all the states. All the states. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. probably and it's at a, least a decade. And like each of the that. standards, they're broken right. into like, this is an algebraic standard. This this is is it's all in one course, right. and so it's hopefully. I would say, just as an old math teacher and having taught one year in it, um, geometry is the one course that kind of got eliminated and dissolved in mm -hmm. six through eleven. Mm -hmm. It really did. It yeah. really kind of like so. There is still algebra, mostly in eighth grade and seventh grade. They know how to solve a variable. Yeah. Um, and then they get into, you know. A little more advanced, algebra two is a lot of principles are taught in sophomore year, which would be you know, secondary math two. And then pre-calculus, those principles are all over secondary math three. So but geometry is the one course that kind of got just put in each one of those. Yeah. It sounds like we're doing the, doing it right. It, it, she just yeah. her point was if you're not doing that, that that's where you can make a huge difference uh, in your math achievements. Yeah. So that's a good observation. Okay, Superintendent or Rod, do you have any comments that you wanted to share or things that you? Well, I was just going to comment on the podcast uh, because I'm really, I've been thinking about that, and you know, I listened to a couple already. I just so I've 
put a little pressure on Robert find out if, you know, his guys aren't very busy, so. <laughs> I'm kidding about that, Robert. You didn't appreciate that company. He did not. You need to go back to that civility. Yeah, I, I can't let him get too big yet. I compliment him too much. So I, gotta, I, did like, I did like the, the speech on homeless to Harvard yeah. and how a teacher made a difference there. And, I, and then I also went to, don't ask me why, but I went to the one on passing a bond where they actually, oh, it, yeah. it intrigued me because it was a 3-2 vote by the school board, by a five-member school board. Two, two were against it originally yeah. on the bond. And, so, and they, had some, yeah. they had some good ideas, a lot they of the same things passed. you said. They, they passed it yeah, they ended the up, and, um, yeah. they ended up and they, the community passed it, those two board members lost their the next election to people that were pro bonds. Yeah. So, yeah. That was kind of interesting. And they had people, I went to that too, they had people in the, wow. the committee that were against it initially, and they invited like people to like to talk about it, and then when those people realized what it was for, then they turned and were, so I thought it was really interesting too. Okay, I thought it was a great conference, and I just, one of the things that, we missed you Karen, by the way, <laughs> we, um, but we were, it was really fun to be together, get to know, like I didn't know Tina very well, and she's delightful. <laughs> I, she was so fun to be around and, and very real, and I just, I thought it was just really interesting and, and good to get to know people and spend some time together, so I appreciate you that. Um, now for our book study, we're covering two sections, so if there's a lot of different habits in here. Um, for sake of time, I want to just share one, and it kind of goes along with, and then those of who want to share can. I'm not going to call on anybody, but if you want to. Um, I don't even remember which one it was. I was I was reading fast and not underlining, and so, but it had to do with the, it kind of went along with the civility. I think it was an argument with the hostile speaker. The point of public comment, and when people talk to us, is to listen. And I thought that was a really good point, is we listen. And like the superintendent, if he could address it, or if we could address it in a civil manner and provide an answer or a direction, that's good. But really, when we're listening, we're listening. Like the public comment is to listen. And then we follow up on it. It's not like we just listen and it goes in one ear, not the other. But we don't need to clarify or defend or argue or, you know, we just need to listen. So I thought that was, I think that was number 18. It's on page 89. Page 89. That's where you're at. Yes. That's the same one I had. Is that the same one you had? Uh -huh. I thought that was a really good You're not the truth police. Right. <laughs> and there's people, you know, and we're, and which is what I tend to be sometimes. Yeah. So that was mine. Does, and you said, does anybody else have one that they'd like to? I think it just goes ahead. Again, in page 97, it says not listening is a habit of the terrible board members. So I think there was a couple that yeah. kind of hit that same thing. Agreed. 16 uh, um, says, ter terrible habit is minimizing public input. Jimmy, you and I talked about this. I think um, as a board, we, we could probably, I don't know if we do it in a work session, but talk about how we handle audience input. And um, when we do have uh, a lot of um, input from the public, if we're doing something that's controversial, you might want to consider letting the public know that we're going to have a maximum time so that it doesn't go on for five hours if we have this amount of time and if, if um, not everybody gets a chance to speak you can write in your comments but, but that's those are people things we can consider our body language when they're speaking to us we we need to refrain from speaking to each other we need to look at them and not get defensive yeah or pose you know there's all those things we need to act attentive. I agree. And one other part of the book, uh, we need to remember that we represent not just our own oh, district, yes. but the entire school district. Yeah, I like that point too. Yeah. I thought that was very, that was a good one. Any others that you'd like to comment on? Well, I just, one, I, and I think I'm guilty of this, totally. Um, I, I think 
think you have to respect all board members, but sometimes we get tired and we get passionate and we say stupid things. <laughs> and uh, I think we need to always just be aware of that because I have done that myself and I go home and I think, why did I say that? And so just to always be aware of that. <laughs> Wait, I cannot think of any time you've ever done anything like that. So <laughs> maybe in your mind you did, but I don't think you've ever said that loud. So I think that is good show for those two things. There were a couple of lines that they repeated over and over. And so the first was like, you thought you just did a wonderful job. <laughs> and then it's like, uh, now you're wondering. <laughs> yeah. I thought those I thought those were very were fun. Okay, well, we will finish up this um, book next month. I think there's one session left. Four, and then we will terrible personal style. Oh. That will be... <laughs> It's, it's funny reading this. Sometimes I'm like, I find myself, I'm like, oh, that was me. <laughs> oh, oops. I thought that was good. Oops. So can I interject? I just got a message on my Apple Watch. Agus Calientes, July 25th, from Tiffany. Just got some Michigan call. Who is Michigan call tonight? That's exciting. Congratulations, Nicholas. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our consent items. Are there any questions or? I, I do have a question. Okay. Um, as I was looking at the out of state request, um, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe I missed the memo or something. I thought we were only supposed to have two per school per year on out of state. We, we changed that policy. Yeah. I, I looked it up on the policy on the online and it still says two. Oh, that's a, I, I remember going through that and changing that policy. I think so we changed the in-state one, but I, I don't remember changing the out-of-state one. And at least when I looked it up on the district website, I'll have to. It double check that yeah. we did. Well, where are these two? Are they like Boise? Uh, one is to Boise Basketball is Indiana, I think it was. Because I know when, one of the um, things we talked about was like, Going to Boise is like going to St. Like it's, it's closer. Like yeah. they're closer yeah. than going to St. George, and so we. Let me double check on that, but that's that's what I would. Then the other one was that if they were going on uh, out of state, they were supposed to also have an in state. I just read the policy. And they're supposed like, to have. What is that? I don't. I don't. Understand. If they're going on an out of state. So which one? Like the like the theater. Well, it's a different group. She's taking her technical theater to one which is different. I was surprised at the amount going because we have kind of tried to make an effort to kind of keep kids in school more. Yes. And it's like every organization is going. I'm wondering if because of the pandemic they missed some years. Yeah. And that's why I think they're that's all part of trying to get the kids out that missed. That's I just all, remember two wonder. years ago we were talking about even because um, the the um, music group was contacting me and saying, are we going to have these anymore? And I know at that time we were saying we shouldn't do out of states. But anyway, I, I did go back and look at the policy as it's listed on the district website. And it did say that um, there should only be two per high school. Let, let me check that. Gary, I thought for sure that's that's what one of the things yeah, we changed. I'm looking now, what you say, Karen, appears right. So. Let me, let me go back and double check that. I, I'm confused because I already thought we'd change it, but I didn't look at the policy because I thought we had. Anyway, so before I we would, approve them, I would yep. think maybe we should double check the policy because, like Connie said, we should look to our own policy. Yep. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we should. And I do remember the discussion about Boise being, yeah. say, mm -hmm. like trying yeah. to make that like more, but that's kind of like, a, even though it's out of state, it's closer than St. George, but I don't remember the. And I thought we'd change it, but that's something. Let me, well, I mean, Marcy, will have the minutes yeah, on that that particular meeting that that we we talked about that. So. We'll, but we'll, with we'll that, I'd make a motion that we appoint uh, approve the minutes, the claims, and the personnel part of this. Do we have a second? I'll second that. So we have a motion by Karen Cronin and a second by Clyde Wolfmuth to approve the minutes, the claims, and the personnel. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and then we will look at those uh, 150 mile and out of state travel requests and push those to next month. Let's do know about the list on that. Thank you for bringing that up, Kara.
All right, suggestions for future board meetings. The only thing I uh, thought we could maybe add to the May is we usually um, do a little something for our, our student board member. Oh, yes. Act surprised. <laughs> well, cheers. What? Um, I had uh, Jenny Schultz with the Northern Box Elder County Suicide Prevention Coalition uh, ask if she could come and do a presentation on the wellness garden in Garland on either the May or June board meeting. Which would be I think better? June will be lighter than May. With, well, with I, I asked her and she said she doesn't have a preference. So. And then also, um, I am going to continue to ask that we maybe do a preliminary budget in May. It's hard in June to have the budget pre presented and be expected to approve it this same night. So if we could have a preliminary budget um, discussion in May, so we kind of have some things knowing what's coming up. Is that and possible? Is that it? Yeah, going out. I know we did it a couple of years ago. It's not holding anything feet to the fire, but uh, we don't have really good numbers, but we can we can hear from the board what their priorities might be if they want to change priorities. And just some, yeah. and it might be an earlier meeting in June. I don't know. I've just never been on a another board where you're expected to bring have such a big budget hearing it the same night. Would it be appropriate to have a discussion without, like, like you said, with, about our priorities, maybe our budget priorities, without, like, because that's kind of numbers. that's kind of how I budget is, I by being here, I hear what your priorities are, work with the super, actually it's the superintendent's budget, so yeah. Yeah, he's the one out. that makes the decisions. Yeah. But we usually, I gather all the information from the directors, and then, and then with the superintendent and. Keith's a critical part of that because eighty-six percent of it's personnel. So maybe and if you could get that together. So I'm not sure what information you want. If you tell me what you want, we'll try to get. Maybe if we could have some of that uh, preliminary information you're getting from the directors and things. I mean, just like uh, I'm used to calling it principal sparks, but <laughs> anyway, um, just like he was talking about some items of double routing, things like that. So if other directors have things in mind. Again, it's just hard to pass a budget. I mean, what, a $130 million budget? Hearing it one time tonight, you're supposed to pass it. So if any information we can have ahead of time, I think helps us to make better decisions. But I, I do think with Rod's transition and training Dave, that's a lot to ask. I, well, I, I think, think we, we can, can probably some put some together, some things together. Priorities. But yeah, I, could I ask all the board members to like put some things together, what you can, but um, as board members, what are your priorities? Like, and maybe email those to me or send me like, where do you think? And we know that what 86, did you say 86% is personnel. So, you know, we have a $130 million budget, but we've got... A lot of that. So where where are our priorities? What are we looking at? What are the you know like you know transportation and gas prices and you know buildings, food like where? And that that's kind of what I'm saying is if we can kind of see those things coming before the night we're supposed to pass yeah. the budget. So we kind of you know we feel like maybe we're gonna have to tighten a little here or with um, money's coming here and here we can cover that. Again, it's just trying to make a better decision um, so that when... So here's my question. So, because I'm hearing two different things and I'm not sure I understand. So you want numbers, like what costs or what we I anticipated costs would be, so we can do that. And Rod, you want to know what our priorities are so we can actually make the, the costs. Yeah, that well, part of my trouble is we did get initial information just this last week from the superintendent's meeting Monday. but but most of that was just we went through 60 bills that were passed in the wasn't 60 yeah. bills that were passed in the legislature i still don't know what the funding for each one of those bills is i've gotten information from the state we'll have time to start walking through it but 
I don't see that information. I don't get that information from the from the state until I'll go down the 25th and 26th. So then yes. after that, I'll have some numbers I can start plugging for what our revenues are going to be. And uh, but as far as trying to put together and fold all the numbers together, no, just as much I as barely you. make it the end of May. <laughs> just as much as you can give us so we have as much so, of a heads up. But I have help now. And so I'll utilize Dave to help me put some of that together. And we, we can probably give you, like, you know, we can give you, like, some of what we've learned in our meetings today. Like, we're going to one to one computing. That's $950,000 this year. That's, and that's almost double what we've spent in the last. You know, we're finishing up, we're finishing up Golden Spy. We, with that, we've just about spent all of the money that we've set aside for buildings. I can give you that kind of information, and that would be probably helpful. Just, you know, I mean, <clears throat> put yourself in our shoes. I mean, if you were expected to pass a budget and you didn't have any of that background knowledge the night of, I mean, as much as you can, as much information as we can. Yeah, have. well, I try to give you that when, when we're doing the budget, but so you want to change things after. No. I want to give you that information, and then you're going to tell me how you want to change things. Help, help me just understand. That's what. No, I'm no. I just most of most of the committees I sit on, we have budgets like a preliminary, at least a month ahead, and then within everything, people can. And so, what do you want to do with that preliminary? Then, Is, are there going to be changes to it? I think just try and become more educated okay. on it, so when we Passive, we have more of an in-depth knowledge what we're passing. Well, I, if, I, if I may, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think as we look at the budget, the budget is almost the exact same thing as the budget was last year and the year before and the year before, only adjusted in certain areas. Like this year, we've already made a statement we're hiring um, some vice principal board teachers. Yeah. Five point four teachers and years. some some assistance. So other than that and fuel costs, more. I think we're very our budget's almost the same. Yeah, it's pretty close. And, yeah. and maybe that's what we need to know. Yeah, you know, it's just. Um, yeah, so, I can. You know, we can put together and bring you information. We, I've got help. <laughs> can bring you lots of information. I'm not trying to be. It, it looks like it looks no, like Murray's going to get a lot of Dave in June and July. <laughs> I, I, just I just I'm not sure what you want. What it because be? it takes me a long time to put to put that that final budget, and I have to advertise it 15 days, and I'm just barely closing closing it up. Within the advertising time, typically you're talking June first to make it. The, June yeah, I have June. to advertise. The eighth is is our board meeting. I have to advertise. Have it out 15 days before that. And a lot of times, I'm just barely putting the finishing touches on it at that point. But we could see if we can accelerate that. If you'll remember, just to remind you, I used to have a finance director, which was me. And you guys decided to cut that position. And those are a lot of the things that I used to do as a finance director, is put, put those budgets together in advance. In a, and then, you know, so the business administrator was doing other things. Now I'm doing both. So, and, and you're so, doing so, a great job. I'm not so saying. if you want both, if you want more information sooner, I would suggest you look at maybe helping us get some more help. So you if know? this has to be out 15 days before, that gives us 15 days to go over. It's certainly not the night before. Yeah. And so I do 15, send it to you. I'm happy to come meet with Ryan when I'm on with that. So well, and, and the other thing I think we can do is look at past budgets. Like the superintendent says, our budgets are pretty similar year to year to year to year, and where we're spending it, and we can kind of take a look at emphasize it. Emphasize where there's going to be changes. Yeah, and, and like I think that would help totally emphasize where changes will be. Like we can all anticipate, like fuel costs going. Why don't you put us on for for a half an hour, and I'll try to emphasize the differences. 
like the fuel costs we main. talked about on the, the main, main on the main on the main, main. Need like the fuel costs yeah. like doing double runs like whatever else might come yeah. up yeah and i can do that yeah that's not a problem those are things i typically put together and then just talk to you guys about on that night but if, if you'd like a an advance some more advance notice on those things then i can we can we can do what we know which sometimes is a little bit risky. <laughs> <laughs> it's a guessing <laughs> Education funding is really unique. <laughs> and the fact that we you don't get them. The and I guess, I mean, changes. I can hear what Karen's saying. Here's a $140 million budget, and I give you a 60 page document for that budget. I know that. And maybe that's what we need to go away from is something that's that complicated. Is that too, you know, I take input on it. If that's too complicated, let's tear it back. Maybe maybe that's the problem. You look at that 60-page document and go, you know, and a lot of it's for finance people. You know, it's for people that do our bond rating and things like that. But we can make, we can, I can try to simplify that. Uh, I just, I had a thought, and I don't know anything about finance, Mr. Editor, you got to spend more, spend less than you make. Yeah. But um, would it be helpful to know major categories of what we generally spend in a, this is what we were in 21, 22 in these major categories? Is that, would that be helpful? Information is helpful. Information so, is helpful. what I do do and what I can have for you by the middle of May pretty much done is I give you your board report with the last three years of spending and I give that to you usually those 15 days ahead but instead I could give it to you in the middle of May so that you could review that maybe that would be helpful I think good information makes good decisions well, I, so, <laughs> but I, I don't know what good you know, I don't yeah. know what you're looking for that's kind of my struggle you know, and so uh, would, would that format work, or is that something that's just confusing to the board? I think for me it's helpful. My biggest, for me, I'll just speak for myself, I'm not speaking for everybody, but major, I, I like the major categories and breaking it down that way. When I get into those budgets and line by line by line by line, my eyes cross. So I like to see major categories to see what we've spent, and, and like a year by year comparison would be helpful. Um, but then I think it's also, behooves us as boards to, like, when he puts it out, we just get as much information, like, we go through it as, as we can, and then Rod's very willing to answer questions. Is the is the board report too complicated, though? Is that, because that's major categories. No, I like that. I, I agree. So if we use the board report, and I do multiple years on that board report, and I could have that by the middle of May, and then we could talk, we can uh, maybe emphasize like where we're having to add teachers, gas increases, those major yeah. areas where we're actually adding to line items or maybe taking it away. Yeah. And with that, I'm just trying to I, get a feel I, for I think that's the what direction. you're talking yeah. about. Okay. Okay. It's perfect. Yeah, thank Dave you. will have it done. Because <laughs> <laughs> you just need to Thank you for being here to help. All right. Um, upcoming events, we already talked about those graduations. And I don't think we have anything on the board handbook. We're good to go. Connie? I'll make a motion that we adjourn. <laughs> I'll second. Motion by Connie to adjourn, a second by Karen. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Thank you for being here. Yes, sir.